Welcome everybody to uh, the third webinar in the now nine webinar series. We'll see if that number grows uh, as, as we continue to do this, but uh, this should be a really excellent one focusing on setups and entry tactics, uh, getting really into uh, the details here. That's our goal with this series. Uh, make sure you stick around until the end. We've got a lot of great stuff to cover. Uh, we'll go through a lot of the entry tactics that we personally use and run through a lot of examples and graphics to explain them very specifically uh, so you can re reproduce them on your own right and pick and choose the ones that you um, that fits best with your system. So welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much again for joining us and uh, Rai, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. So today's discussion is going to be based on, you know, uh, a step above what we discussed last time with mindset and edges. And we'll kind of circle back to what we did last time and then uh, build upon that. So the series of nine webinars is continuously going to build upon the last one. And if you haven't watched the first two, they're already you know sent out. If you signed up for the email list or on YouTube, uh, if you if you want to go to the the Trader Line YouTube channel. So framework three focuses on setups and entry tactics. Um, before we get started, if you have any questions on setups and entry tactics, uh, put them in the Q&A tab. I'll have, uh, I have the Q&A tab up here and maybe we can answer some on the fly as we get them. Uh, and that will kind of drive the conversation today. So before we get started, it's the ultimate guide pledge, which basically says you guys will, uh, you know, match our energy. Uh, we've increased the webinars from seven to nine because we feel like we could better cover each topic and dedicate a lot more time to each of the, the frameworks. So it's, you know, your energy, has, we're going to match what we see in terms of enthusiasm, sharing this with others, making sure that you extract a lot of, you know, knowledge uh, out of this and make this the best possible journey over the next uh, nine weeks as you possibly can. So we're really interested in seeing how many traders we can convert from stage one to two and two to three over the span of these nine weeks, or at least make some sort of difference in the way you guys are trading and see, you know, at the end of the day, see results. So uh, it will be very cool to, to see that over the next uh, seven weeks, since we're two weeks into it. Um, the agenda today will circle back to what we talked about last time. We will talk about entry tactics, uh, what they mean, what they are, uh, how we define them, and then how they help us. Uh, this is, again, a step towards building a full framework uh, and a full system for your trading. And this component is likely uh, you know, one of the key ones in terms of execution of what you're doing in the markets, where you do a lot of prep work, right? And then you have to execute upon that prep work. This focuses on how you can execute in the market. And you know, if you have a name on radar, how do you get into that name? How do you define your stop? How do you define your entry point? Uh, and this also will go into a little bit into position sizing, but we will get more into position sizing in, in other webinars. So we'll you know cover a whole bunch of different ways and then end it off with a checklist and then take your guys' questions as they come through as well. So Revisiting the three pillars of success from webinar two that we spoke about, uh, the first one being mindset is likely the most important one. So if you have some, you know, something personal going on and you still want to trade, if you have something, you know, you're busy outside and it's, you know, a, a distraction, uh, trading and investing, they are just, you know, they're professions just like any other profession. If you have a nine to five job, if you're an accountant, if you're you know, a, a chemist, a you know, physics, et cetera, doesn't really matter. They all require dedication. And so does trading if, you know, likely a lot more dedication than all these other professions combined. The second we discuss, uh, pillar we discussed was edges. So we highlighted our two edges that we talked about. If, if, if you forget everything else, the two edges we, we spoke about were the, uh, the high volume edge and the relative strength edge. If you were to just master those two, right? Master those two, just um, look at each of them, their, their aspects, and we will build upon them uh, today in terms of entry tactics. But you need an edge in the market for you to repeatedly execute and repeatedly draw an income. And that was the second pillar. The third we talked about was setup. So uh, there's a lot more to setups than, than the word itself. 
right? Uh, position sizing, risk management, and all of that stuff kind of stems from the word setups. And there's a lot to discuss there. And that's what the focus will be over the next couple of weeks to really, you know, dive deep into the world of setups, what they mean, and really how do you execute upon these theoretical concepts that we've been uh, talking about. So the key takeaway, if you didn't take anything else away from webinar two, was the fact that where we need to maintain a mindset where we need to make some progress so that our psychologies and the way we think are positive and a positive approach, um, you know, a winning approach basically comes from a mindset where I need to make a little bit of progress from market cycle to market cycle and not fall in love with stocks and say, you know, they, this thing will go to 200 and set some un unrealistic profit targets, et cetera. So the idea is, we need to go from stage two to stage three or stage one to stage two. We need to look at our equity curves and make decisions and really look at our results that we're getting in the market so that we could turn that ship around and move from one stage uh, to the next. So the EC mindset or the equity curve mindset, all it's doing is saying, hey, this is what my results are. And this is what I need to, this is what I know is working at this moment in time. And I need to exploit what is working for me a lot more than what isn't working for me and focus on that aspect of my trading so that I could have smaller losses and larger wins uh, net net so that we could see a higher, higher low on our equity curves. So this mindset is fairly important, especially for new traders. It negates some of the emotion that the market tries to, uh, tries to kind of magnify with uh, traders in year one to seven. And this really will allow you to look at your losses. So look at your losses so that we can improve upon what we're bad at. And if we kind of, you know, what Jared Tendler says is if, if we improve our C game, our A game will obviously be magnified and get better and better. So here's a reminder on the edges and setups that we talked about in the last webinar. We talked about the HV edge which is you know, basically a visual bidding characteristic in the market. It increases chances of a positive outcome. Prior leadership stocks have exhibited this characteristic and there's no shortage of them. Um, you know, market cycle to market cycle earnings, um, you know, earnings to earnings uh, from, from one quarter to the next, right? They can be executed repeatedly. So any edge that you have in the market, doesn't matter what you want to, you know, you could say, I only look at, uh, estimated growth for companies. And I've seen that this is a, you know, this seems to be, re you know, repeatedly something that companies that go up to, to 300% exhibit, that could be something that, you know, you could build an edge around in the market. So some sort of visual bidding characteristic executed repeatedly. It's a pattern that you see in the stocks that are going up tenfold, uh, you know, two, three, four, five hundred percent over a span of, you know, two to three, four, five years. They must be self-studied. So you cannot, again, follow someone into, uh, it, you know, it, you can't make a point of following someone and they will be your savior in the markets. That does not work. If you want to be a professional, that's what we want to be in this, you know, in, in the trading world or the investing world. So you have to learn, uh, get your hands dirty and make sure that you're the one doing the hard work and you're not, you know, really relying on other people to do so. So that's the first edge that we discussed and we will continue to discuss it today. And then the second one that we discussed was the relative strength edge, which was, you know, we see when stocks, when the market is pulling in, relatively the stocks are showing strength as to what the market is doing. And this is a very key visual that shows up on the charts in many different ways. And that seems to be a visual that many winning stocks uh, tend to exhibit, and we covered some of the the statistics behind that, and why uh, this could be a second edge for you in the markets. So now we'll get basically into entry tactics, which will build upon what an edge is, and uh, I think we could get right into it. So what are entry tactics, right? So just like edges, entry tactics must be self studied. They, you have to, it, it comes down to execution. And when, when you prep and you do all the work at the end of the day, uh, it comes down to, you know, that confidence builds up 
as you do, as you repeatedly do your routines. And then when it's time to execute, it comes down to entry tactics. How will I enter this name that I have an edge in the markets that I know works from market cycle to market cycle, from quarter to quarter, from year to year? How can I execute this repeatedly that carries over from the edges? You know, you, you execute upon your edges uh, repeatedly. And the, that's the same thing with entry tactics. And the focus here is how do I get an optimal risk reward so that I can then position size manage risk and all these other aspects. So the things that we carry over from edges is pretty much the same stuff, except this will be the primary focus of today. How do we you know, define our risk reward? How do we find ways to enter names after we know that this is, there's a probability of a positive outcome, right? That we, that we said, you know, Mark, Douglar, uh, Mark Douglas says, quote, quote we know we can execute upon this edge repeatedly and we've studied it ourselves already, right? So now this will become kind of the focus of today. How do we focus uh, on getting a good risk reward? So entry tactics are nothing but after you observe an edge, which is always the first step. If you don't observe an edge, if you haven't seen examples of your edge in play, if you don't have visuals of what your edge looks like in the market, then you doesn't matter what entry tactic you employ. Uh, you could say that, you know, uh, Minervini told me to buy pivot highs. That's why I will buy pivot highs. That's not something that you have self-studied. Then you will see a lot of failure in that, right? So a lot of what you do in the markets has to build upon the our prior knowledge and our prior knowledge of observing and having an edge in the market. So if we have the high volume edge or the relative strength edge, we can then build upon those and come up with entry tactics. So entry tactics allow you to manage risk. They allow us the position size. That's most important because we, without risk management, you can't position size. And without position size, you can't make many, you know, pretty much any money in the market. So traders, when they're starting out, have kind of two different mindsets as they go about it. There's this world of if you don't size up and you act manly, then you will never make it those people tend to blow up a couple of times before they figure it out. And then there's the other mindset of, I know I'm in a journey. I know I'm going to move from stage one to stage two over a span of time. And I will size according to my confidence and how I observe my edges and how I employ the entry tactics over a span of time. So today's webinar is not going to be a shortcut for you to skip a whole bunch of years in your trading but it will give you the framework and the mindset that it's going, if you go through these steps of having an edge and then building entry tactics upon them, you will get there, be it three to six months, eight to 10 months, one to three years, or four to seven years over a span of time. So few entry tactics that, you know, I, I just threw a whole bunch on this slide on purpose where, you know, consolidation pivots, base pivots, pivot retests, undercut rallies, volume support, a whole bunch of other ones that I've come up with for my own trading based on these two edges that I see in the markets. And that's something you have to replicate on your end as well. You identify edge, step one, step two. Now, how do I enter these names to define my risk so that I can position size because without position size and risk management, I can't make an income in the markets. So if we take a look at just the two edges that we have, the high volume edge is an edge. It's a visual that we see many winning stocks, Facebook, Google, Netflix, uh, many smaller mid cap companies before they go to be big caps like Cloudflare, et cetera, have always exhibited these, the high volume edge. And how do we now enter these names? We will discuss, you know, the HVC, the high, high volume close. We'll discuss the volume support and we'll discuss the whole number sport. These are three entry tactics that we can employ when we see this edge in the market. With the relative strength edge, we could have a consolidation pivot and a base pivot. And something as we you know move forward is all of these entry tactics, they seem to work as long as you study them. Just like I said in the last webinar, every indicator in the market works. If you study what the indicators support, you know, what, what it does, how it's mathematically calculated, 
how those traders came up with it and how they mastered it is they actually used it over a span of time to see a positive result. And that's why they call it an indicator, be it Fibonacci or, or, you know, clouds and all of this other, you know, RSI, MACD, et cetera. So all, you know, you have to, we, we will study each of these today and, and visualize, you know, showcase these and how we can manage risk from them. So what is an entry tactic? This is where Richard, We'll take over and kind of get into the depths of what is an entry tactic and, and some of the visuals that he's put together. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rai. So the the text on this screen, it's something we really want to drill into you guys, and it'll be a kind of recurring theme today. Um, an entry tactic is a short term pattern in the context of an overall setup in a promising stock that is exhibiting your edges. That's a really important phrase. So you know, we'll say that a lot of times today in, in various different ways. And what it allows you to do is establish a tight and logical entry. This is something that Ross has, you know, I've learned so, so much from Ross here, tight and logical entry that allows you to place a stop loss where if the short-term entry tactic fails, you're out with a small loss, but you can position size in a promising stock and get a good uh, entry point, a good, a good cost basis to potentially uh, ride that stock as it performs for you. And a common thread with these entry tactics as, as we go through them today is they'll often be a short-term expectation breaker. You know, with, with the tight area range uh, entry tactics that, we'll, that I'll discuss later, the expectation is it's gonna stay in the range and then it breaks out or, or moves to the one side or the downside. That's the expectation breaker. We've also got uh, rise techniques where, you know, based on the previous close, you know, the expectation is it goes lower and it holds, right? So we, we want to be thinking about these themes. One, an entry tactic is a short-term pattern in the context of an overall setup. And we always want to be establishing a tight and logical uh, entry with a clear stop loss. We've got a graphic over here on the right-hand side, which we'll dive into uh, later on with a great example. These are kind of range breakouts. And then again, always think about what is the expectation based on price action and what are expectation breakers that you see? And we can basically uh, take advantage of those expectation breakers uh, to enter the stock with a very tight and logical stop loss uh, and position size nicely. So just want to reemphasize this. This is a great overall framework to think about. And, and again, we'll, we'll repeat this a few times today. Uh, Ryan, anything to add on this slide? No, I, I, I don't have much to add. And I think, you know, try try to think of this as try to build upon this and don't try to skip steps. Like what we're saying, I think every word here kind of matters. And if you can't submit this and you say, hey, you know, show me the show me the money. How do I enter this? How do I exit? Send me a stock pick. That's how you fail. Uh, and you'll continuously fail and you'll learn the hard way. Right. And we've learned the hard way. I, I've I've subscribed and followed people, et cetera, and all of that stuff seems to work in a really good market. But if you really understand why we're doing this and what we're doing here, it makes a whole bunch of difference because then you can, you know, really execute upon it yourself. So short term expectation breakers, it's almost like I expect this to happen. And when this doesn't happen and the reverse happens, then I need to switch my mindset and really, you know, um, it's 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 kind of I would say something you learn after six seven eight years that that we're trying to kind of teach you guys today because it's going to make a difference even if you're in year two and year three and you understand this concept it will allow you to execute a lot better uh, in the markets so I think we could go to the next one Richard and if you want to continue yeah so what does a tight and logical stop loss actually mean well, you know how how can i practically apply that uh basically going back to the entry tactic it's not really an entry tactic unless it allows for this meaning you can get stopped out with a very small loss if the entry tactic fails and if it succeeds your position in the stock as it completes the setup so what does logical mean logical means a violation of the short-term pattern would signal that the setup and entry tactic has failed. Uh, Mark Minervini says, you know, the train is not coming on schedule, right? That, that's how he phrases it. And that's a really great analogy. Um, what does tight mean? Tight 
I mean, it depends on the trader, but for me, uh, the stop law, the stop would limit losses to just a few percent, the less, the better. Uh, and if you can't set such a stop, there isn't a setup. Just wait, just wait for that entry tactic to show. And this is really key because, you know, one of the first mistakes that I made um, when I was first starting to, to trade is I would enter promising stocks that were strong but I would enter a little bit randomly where it's already extended from, you know, a pivot buy or the base pivot. It was already kind of along its run. And I would set tight stop losses where it'd be 3%, 5%, whatever it was. And natural reactions would just stop me out. Uh, and I, I was frustrated until I kind of looked back at my trades and realized that there was always a better entry lower where, where the price action was tighter, where it was forming a range. So it doesn't matter if, you know, arbitrarily setting tight stops of 3%, 5%, whatever the number is, that doesn't help you. It, it, it also has to line up with a logical spot where the setup, the entry tactic is becoming invalidated. And this can be a higher low, like it, like in this example with the graphic, um, Ross uses moving averages, like the 10 day moving average, the 50 day. Um, it doesn't really matter as long as it's logical for the applied setup and it makes sense to you based on how you view the market and how you trade. Uh, every trader is going to be a little bit different. You know, for Rye, uh, he, he cares so much about the whole numbers. That's, that's, a, that's a winning characteristic that he's studied. And if a stock violates that, he's out. If he's buying versus that whole number, he's buying 30.1, 30.15, 30.03. If it violates the whole number, that's his li line in the sand. That's the tight and logical stop for him where he's out. But he's not buying 35 and setting his stop at 30 because that wouldn't complete the entry tactic. He's buying very carefully within his entry tactic so he will, he'll keep those losses small and uh, be able to escape with a very tight loss where he can try again multiple times if another entry tactic develops. So this is another really key slide. Um, and Rai, I definitely want to hear your thoughts on this as well. But I think it's really important. It's, it's twofold. It has to be tight and logical. That's the key thing that I want to get across. Just tight doesn't work. Um, just logical doesn't necessarily work. They have to be coupled together where uh, the entry tactic satisfi satisfies both of, both of these conditions. Yeah. So the the way you know th these things kind of play out at the end of the day is you'll see a pattern of in your execution of where when you enter and things line up and the train arrives on time or the tiger you know tiger in the tank any of these analogies that that you know um, traders come up with. All it means is things are lining up and what you did has, has a positive outcome over a span of time, right? So the tight is also relative. So for an investor, um, if he's looking at the monthly chart and they see an entry in, you know, right near all time highs and the stock has three months of tight action from on a technical basis and now they're anticipating growth, that could be a, you know, an investment plus a technical decision that they make tight for a swing trader that you know uh in a day trader is very different they're purely they've done you know uh, they know that the broader setup exists they know the broader edge exists now they're focusing in on how can i manage my risk and where can i enter let's say if i want to buy 5000 shares and i see tightness in price action i risk a whole bunch of money in the markets but my risk is 2 to 3% or could be dollar based risk it could be uh share based risk it, it could be any you know risk is what tolerance do you have to see your setup play out and you you can logically define hey when this stock if it breaks out and comes right back in and violates this level my emotions shouldn't turn into i love this company i believe in this company i uh I think this is the greatest company ever and I just need to hold on. And all of these thoughts are stage one, two thoughts where all of a sudden you define a stop, you define an entry, you've done all your hard work. You, you're not thinking in a series of trades. You're thinking about this one trade and I need to win this trade over the market. That mindset won't work. 
you need to go to the opposite mindset where when you know that this entry tactic, if you execute 40 times in a row, will give you a winning outcome in the markets. And if you don't know that in the back of your head, when this comes right back in and violates the level that you logically set for yourself before you even enter the name, you need to get comfortable with losses in the market, right? So if you're not comfortable and you don't develop that over a span of time, you're making it harder and harder for yourself to move to stage three as much as possible. The other thing I, I think, you know, tight and logical stop. So when we really get into real examples, tight is always relative to a stock, right? Risk tolerance is relative to a trader and what they feel and violation of a setup is based on something that you study in prior setups that you see and prior edges that you saw. Hey, the name seemed to VCP. Let's just pick on VCP. 2T, 3T, 4T, right? Minervini just didn't wake up one day and said, hey, I see 2Ts are more likely to succeed. I see 3Ts fail a whole bunch more and 4Ts really. You know, these variations and these different nuances, you know, that people come up with and end up writing a whole book on their success. This is over a span of time. And the more comfortable you get with the fact that you will not get from one to 100, but you will start with something then you will notice a pattern, then you will make your own tweaks to it. And what works for you uh, likely may not work for someone else. So Ross uses moving averages. You, for the life of him, if I if I just you know put a kind of a gun to his head, he will never re remove moving averages because he's seen uh, good stocks tend to hold 10 weeks. Good stocks, when they come in, tend to hold 65 EMAs. So he has seen this over and over again. So now he's using 65 EMAs. You may see something else, right? That's where the creative part of you will come into play, right? When you do studies and you look at the market, that's the creative part of you and how you see the market is very, is going to be very unique than how someone else um, sees the market as well. So I think we could get right into kind of this, yeah. that will happen to you again and again in the markets. It will it's destined to happen. You're destined to have a strategy that will succeed 40% of the time and fail 60% of the time, but you could still make so much money if you succeed even 30 to 40% um, of the time. Richard, if you want to discuss this. Yeah. So this is something that I'm sure uh, every single person watching this can relate to. I mean, uh, just, just drop in the chat if you've had a failed breakout. I, I think every single person uh, should have experienced that. But, you know, you have the perfect entry, the stock rockets higher on volume. And then the next day or the, the next day after that, it completely reverses down, uh, takes out your stop and, and you're out of the trade and you're frustrated. Um, and it, it sucks, right? Losses aren't fun. But the point that we're trying to make with the tight and logical stop loss is that losses won't take you out of the game. In fact, it's kind of the the the, the cost of doing business. Uh, Dr. Wish, he did a presentation uh, a month or so ago for John Boyk's class, and he said, every stop loss hit takes me closer to my next winner. That's his perspective. And I, I think that's perfect. Stops are there to protect you and to protect your account over the long term. You know, not a, you know, a 50% batting average in trading is fantastic, especially if you're triggering, uh, you know, high, high reward to, to low risk areas. That's amazing. You can make a fortune with that. You can make a fortune with 30% win rate, but you have to protect yourself when this happens. And uh, that that's both financially with keeping your losses small, as well as mentally, you have to be prepared for this to happen because it happens every single week, every single year, every, every single month, whatever period it is. So don't be afraid of this plan ahead, almost expect when you enter a trade that this will happen and, and think about how will you protect yourself? Where are you placing your stop? When are you going to move your stop up? That's something we'll get into in a, in a future one, but plan for this occurrence because it's going to happen to you. And if you don't plan for it, you'll be knocked off your game financially as well as mentally. And if it sets up again, which, you know, is often the case, you want to be ready for that next entry tactic that, uh, that comes around because, you know, maybe that's the time that it'll work. And often you have to try trades multiple times uh, to finally get that, uh, that winning trade. And one winning trade will pay for three, five, 10 of these. 
easy. So you have to think in a series. We, we talked about that before. You have to think in a series of trades over time, over the course of a month, over the course of a year, over the course of your trading career. If you take small losses of, you know, 2%, 3%, 4%, 5% over and over again, but you're triggering, you know, uh, you're focused on high potential situations, high potential setups, um, those at the end of the day are going to be washed aside and, and your winners will overwhelmingly pay for your losers. So that's the key point here. Keep the losses tight and logical so you protect yourself and your downside um, when when these stopouts do, do, do occur. Yeah. And the only thing that I would add is um, maybe, you know, just take a look at your, 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 you know, the series of trades that we're talking about. Just if you print a whole bunch of trades that you made and maybe you can identify, hey, I did everything according to my entry tactic. I defined my stop loss, but look at where you actually exited, right? If the exit, your planned exit was here and you exited somewhere down here you didn't follow your plan, right? Or or you it broke out and now it gaps down on you. What what's you know what's stopping you from making that decision and just turning your mindset around, right? Where all of a sudden you think it will just come back and then I will do this and that and that. It happens to all of us, you know, everybody. So print out, you know, maybe your last 20, 30, 40 trades and just label them. Hey, I my entry tactic was this. My stop was this. This is where I exited the trade. I'm not listening to my own entry tactics. If you just listen to, to you know your plan, it will make a lot of traders much more, it, you know, in terms of discipline and losing, you know, uh, turning around their 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 losses. It will minimize what you actually. Uh, do when you follow your plan. So a lot of traders in stage one just don't follow uh, something that they set out to do. They kind of start doing the opposite when the market just slaps them in the face and all of a sudden they're rattled, right? And when you're rattled, your decision-making, your emotions take over, you're not thinking rationally. And that's the name of the game. You need to think rationally when you're under pressure. That's the same thing in pro sports. That's the same thing in any, you know, uh, job that you might have, if you're put under pressure and you can't make your decision making still doesn't align the same way, uh, then you have poor performance, right? That's ex exactly what we have as stage one and twos um, at the end of the day. So it's very important to be realistic, to look at what you're doing and really just do this exercise maybe for the past 20, 30 trades. And if you do that, you could tag me on Twitter or uh, Richard on Twitter, and we'll, we'll, we're happy to take a look and, you know, see what your past 20, 30 trades look like and how do you kind of label, you know, I entered here, I knew my stop loss was this, but I made this mistake. Just saying that to yourself and the next time this happens, which happens to everybody in the market, uh, will allow you to make rational, non-emotional and kind of, you know, good professional decisions at the end of the day. So. Uh, with that, I think we could go to the next one. Yeah. Um, so I th I thought this quote applied really well, um, and and I I saw something in the chat that I want to apply this back to. Uh, the quote is from Jesse Livermore: "The tape does not concern itself with the why and wherefore. The reason for what a certain stock does day to day uh, may not be known for two to three days or weeks or months. But what the dickens does that matter? Your business with the tape is now, not tomorrow." Um, so I, I saw something in the chat that that was something along the lines of the market makers are out to get stops or, or something like that. For me, you want to focus on your perspective, your risk, and that's all that matters. And you have to follow your rules for, for risk management and setting stop losses and think about yourself. Um, the market is not some nebulous secret agent just destined to, you know, uh, to, to, knock out your stops a trade is either going to work or it's not going to work and you have to manage your risk either way go let ahead me, Ryan. Let me stay yeah. on that. so if a market maker is going to stop you out what are you going to do you want to find them and go to your door to their doorstep and stop them you can't right that's the reality of what you're dealing with could be a market maker could be someone could be big brother watching you trade whatever it doesn't matter at the end of the day it really 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 doesn't matter 
if you think some force is out to get your 20, 30, 40, 50, hundred thousand dollar account, or even one, five, ten million dollar account, you are a drop in a bu big bucket of liquidity and nobody really cares about what you're doing. And that's the reality of it. And that's, you have to not blame other people for your decisions, your your you know what you see in the markets, how you interpret it, cannot be blamed on other people to make yourself feel better. That's humans as you know as as we function tend to do this naturally. There's no person on the other end sitting there to screw you over. And if you have that mindset, you'll never be successful, right? That comes to, again, that first pillar we talked about. You have to have a winning mindset. You cannot blame a market maker. You cannot blame uh, this Twitter newsletter did this and this person did this to me. And that mindset, you successful traders uh, that I've studied and I have a pile of books right here that I've studied, you know, thousands and thousands of pages. None of them said, hey, I'm, I am I need market makers to not be in the market for me to make money. So that has to be flushed out. Completely yeah. get rid of that if you want to have any ounce of success that you want to see in the markets, or else you're just having this negative psychology and this negative mindset of blaming other people for your own results that will not be a positive outcome for yourself. So yes, there are market makers. Yes, they will screw you over. So what are you going to do about it? That's what yeah. matters more than kind of, you know, saying these forces exist and dark pools are doing this. And uh, this person is, you know, placed the bet and now I'm trading off of his. None of that. It's you and the market. Uh, any of these Stan Weinstein doesn't sit there and talk to market makers on what they're doing. Nobody cares uh, about that stuff. So as long as you have an edge, then you employ an entry tactic on that from a trading swing trading perspective, position trading perspective. If you just do those three in sequence, no market maker is going to stop you from, you know, I'm up what 47 or 47 or 50% this year. They haven't screwed me over. All I'm doing is going through what I know tends to work for me over a series of trades. And there's not a market maker out there that could do a thing about it. At the end of the day. So yeah, the, the key point is whatever, it, even if they are doing that, it's not an excuse to not set stops. You can't use that excuse and blame somebody else. You have to manage your risk. Um, you know, Ross has has a rule during bear market, uh, you know, uh, during bull market, strong uptrends where uh, his stops are at an end of day basis. Whatever tactic you employ to manage your risk, you have to do that. Uh, blaming the market makers is not an excuse to not manage your risk. That's the key point here. And and here we manage risk in real time. You know, price action is all that matters at the end of the day. That's the key point here. You know, shakeouts do happen. And we've got, uh, we'll talk about an entry tactic today that kind of exploits that and that you can use. Um, Rye, it looks like you got something more to add here. Yeah, no, I think I think it's it's really important. Like my mindset is way too important for you. Don't blame people. It just right. kind of pisses me off in a way because you're trying to deflect your own laziness to make yourself feel better about yourself by blaming some unknown force that you've never seen, studied, or know about, right? Uh, have you met a market maker? Do you know what they do? It's just like some of these theories, like end of quarter rebalancing happens and people just make that a whole big deal, even though they don't really understand because someone told them that happens, right? Etc. So anything that you do, any any aspect of, of being a professional, you have to internalize and really do the dirty work to see that. And let's get back to, to this because I could keep talking of, about that forever, but. Yeah, this is a key point though here. And and this is another way to think about uh, tight logical stops and stops in general. It's it's simply the cost of business. You're buying a ticket with your stop loss amount that gives you access to, to the boat ride, the ferry ride that allows you to ride that stock. You should think about when you give, when you place your entry and place your stop, the difference between those two values multiplied by the number of shares, that's your ticket. That's you've, you've paid that it's gone. And then if the, the stock works for you and you can move up your stop, then suddenly you got a free ride. But that should be an expectation is that when you place your your stop and your entry, that that money should 
you shouldn't be really worried about that. You've already, that's your ticket to ride basically. Um, so let's see. Yeah. Don't fear stops. Thank them. Anybody who's been trading, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, they're going to, they're going to say the number one thing is cut losses short. I think Mike Webster's posted his trades and about, uh, two thirds of them are say cut losses short. I, I think pretty much. Um, so don't fear your stops. Thank them. They're going to, what's, that they're going to be what keeps you in the game for for decades and that's what's going to allow you to take advantage of bull markets take advantage of uptrends uh if you're on the short side take advantage of downtrends but regardless stop losses are simply the cost of doing business and you're going to get get stop hits so accept that and plan for it right anything that no i think that this analogy is really good you know you're just you you have to thank your stops for for, for you know they they they're there to not ruin your uh, long you know how long you could stay in the markets at the end of the day right even the best people i think minervini posted his trades from 2020 or 2021 um i've, I've seen trade you know i see ross's trades all the time and there's a whole bunch of losses in there but they still come out you know ross had a track record i think of three years and 30 percent in a row uh you know about a decade and a half ago where and also he was part of that size yeah yeah. when you he was part of that team that i think may return 50 15 million to 850 million and he he to this day he doesn't do anything different he looks at charts looks at fundamentals combines them places a few moving averages experiences a whole bunch of losses and comes out on top year to year simple right and he believes in that because that journey that took him from you know that whole team from 15 to 850 that's what they did and they're not doing anything different today it's just a different you know it's 2023 now and it's not you know 1998 1997 right uh time frame so this is a great analogy i think you know we could even put this on a t-shirt or something yeah. <laughs> and, and you might have to buy multiple tickets, right? It might not work. The You might not catch the first flight or, or the first boat ride. So don't worry about it. Uh, you can control how much the ticket costs based on your entry tactic. And that's the goal today. How, how do you buy uh, a low cost ticket to get on a high potential stock? So let's keep on going. Uh, context matters. Uh, again, uh, we, we mentioned this would be the important thing. One of the important things that we come back to entry tactics should not be used in isolation again even if you have a tight and logical stop loss but the stock is extended 40 percent above the the 10 day moving average or you know making 52 week lows and you know getting destroyed it doesn't it that you're not allowed to apply your entry tactics if there's no overall setup and there's no edges present so last webinar we, we talked about edges we talked about the overall entry setups we use Entry tactics are like the last step and all the other steps have to be met before you can get to the last step. Uh, Oliver Kell, you know, mentions a similar thing with timeframes. If it's not set up on a weekly and daily, you have no right to look at an intraday chart to look for an entry. That's really important. If it's not overall set up, there's no point in looking for an entry tactic. Um, so entry tactics should not be used in isolation. Use them in a strong setup, a strong stock, a strong market. Uh, with, where multiple edges are showing, uh, and that's that's what kind of stacks the odds in your favor. Uh, Rye, anything you want to add to to nail this point home? Yeah. So in terms of context, what what we're really trying to say is there are a whole bunch of factors that also matter, right? You could pick a chart in the middle of nowhere, and it looks it's nice, tight, logical, and uh, the market around it is really really bad, right? And it breaks out and it fails. That's what we experience, you know, recently even as of what are we, September 15, 16 area, right? There's some setups in the market working. There's some, if you employ the entry tactics, the same ones, but the market is not conducive to breakouts or your pivots yet. Those things matter. You could have have an edge. You can have, uh, you know, you visualize your edge first step. You take that stock and you track it. And you then notice, okay, this is now at a, you know, it's consolidating tight enough. I can define my stop loss and my entry, 
But then there are some other factors that can also influence the fact that it breaks out and comes back in, right? And fails. That's that's the market, you know, at work. That's the environment that uh, that's at work. And that's something I saw uh, on, on Twitter recently as well as like environment is greater than a setup, right? So that's what really, what this is trying to say is you can have a setup ready to go, but if the environment is not made for uh, consolidation pivots, if the environment is a bear market, if the environment is what we experienced in 2022, most of 2022, then it really doesn't matter what you do. It's going to fail and not work. So have some you know, of that context in mind. We're going into the depths of entry tactics now, but you should not be, uh, forget the bigger picture and what we're trying to build upon as well so uh, yeah and coming back uh, quickly to to the analogy with the ticket uh i see something in the chat uh minervini also uh says to think about it as you know insurance policy yeah that's a great way to think about it as well you know i don't know how many stocks i've gotten stopped out of and then they drop uh you know 40 percent 60 percent 70 percent i got stopped out of peloton there was like a low cheat consolidation pivot um, after it already kind of top, topped, but obviously we don't know that uh, unless looking at hindsight. And then that's when it dropped 90% from that point. But I escaped with a 2 3% stop loss. Like it is your insurance policy. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be what keeps you in the game and allows you to keep trying these high potential stocks that can make you a fortune. So just, yeah, that's another great point. And Minervini's books are, are fantastic. Definitely recommend them. They're a, a more great frameworks to to think about this stuff. All right. So, so next, yeah. let's now we'll get enough of that psychology talk and and why we feel it's very important. If you think that bores you out and is not important, it's probably more important than what we will cover the rest of the presentation. Um, and a lot of people you'll see say the same thing. And any anyone trading eight, you know, six, seven, eight years or more. We'll say the same thing. The psychological part is a lot more, becomes a lot more important after you learn this mechanical part, which is, hey, anybody can scan for high volume. Anybody can scan for relative strength. But what's the psychology behind? What makes me you know, enter this name at the right time where the most market participants are you know, are kind of pointing in, the one, in one direction? That's how price goes up at the end of the day. So we'll cover high volume close now. We'll cover high volume, uh, whole number support, range breakouts, undercut rallies, loops reversals, pull back the support, and then go over live examples. Any of these, you know, I've mastered these two. I, I you know, if you give me uh, uh, a stock that has the highest volume ever, I can pick that stock apart and get the proper entry that I need because I, I just, I know it, you know, uh, now. I've, I've every earnings cycle we see, you know, uh, last year, for example, just, just the stat, how many high volume edge, you know, how many stocks gapped up on high volume, be it high, highest volume ever one year IPO or since last earnings, it was about 88 stocks. The year before was a lot more. It was about 124 or 126. That's the depth of my knowledge on this topic, where I know off the top of my head, how many HVs there were, which ones I traded, which ones I tracked, which ones were good ones. I, I have a whole like, uh, like a whole, you know, model book on this stuff that I know I, if I keep track of it, these things will happen. They have happened this earning cycle. We'll cover that in live examples, but that's the depth you have to go to if you want to be a professional and really see this through on the other end and make big, big progress. So the other ones, range breakout, undercut rally, oops, reversals, and pullback support are ones that Richard will go over in depth. Uh, and I think it's a good time to kind of get right into it now. So this first example that um, I've put together is, you know, very simple. It combines a few things uh, together. So this is CELH back in 2020. And what CELH did was this gapped up based for an entire quarter. It reported earnings, gapped up, tight consolidation, sideways action, no real progress. And then it gapped up again. And when this gapped up again, this 7 million that it saw through the 25 to 30 mark was my visual edge. That's the first component of your trading. You need an edge. What's the edge? This is the highest volume ever. This stock saw the highest volume 
it's ever traded in its journey in the stock market at this point in time. So now this is on my radar. Step one is done. Now, how do I enter this name? That's what we're here for today, right? There are a few ways I enter these type of names. I can go to, you know, I can look at the highest volume close, which is where did this name close? And I could draw a straight line. That's one way of tracking that above that line, I have some interest to go long the stock. Below that line, I need to wait for a new consolidation. Very simple way of defining, you know, if you're new to trading, that's one way to kind of get into these names. The second way is to look at kind of volume support. So what I would do is every time a name has a setup, a, you know, a, now an, a visual edge on the daily chart, I pull up the 15 minute and I look at where did the bulk of the volume trade on this particular day? So I pull up the 15 minute on this particular day. It's very easy to visually see, did it get most of the volume early on in the session? Where did it get that volume? And if the stock were to pull back in, right? I should, we should see secondary demand and my risk at that point when I'm defining volume support will be very, very low. That's the second entry tactic after you visualize your edge in the markets. The third one that I employ now, I, like I said, every time I see these, it's, I, I know there's an opportunity to make money in the markets because I can enter this three, four, five different ways that I see that have worked in the past and I've mastered each of them. The third way I look at it is if this is the first time the stock is going into the $20 area, $25 area, $30 area, that's, that is always a sign of it. there's go going to be an increase in liquidity in that stock. And that's just, it gets on more radars, more funds are interested, People that have a lot more money, 100 million, 200 million, 300 million portfolios, they look for stories that they really believe in. They look for stories that they feel can double and triple in terms of their, you know, they put in 50 million into the stock. They can turn that 50 to 75 and 100 at the end of the day, right? So they are far more interested as the price goes higher and liquidity is going to increase on those names. How do I know that? That's just an observation you make. You make that again and again, and over a span of time, you incorporate that into how you think. So the third way I, I enter this name is when this stock for the first time has traded above the $30 mark, came back in, that's that's my whole number kind of entry. So I combine the fact that this was volume support, combine the fact that this was holding the 30 mark on its pullback, and then that's where the expectation breaker mindset comes in. I you know The stock is pulling in, on increasing volume, I expect this stock to go lower into you know this range, this highest volume ever range. It didn't do that, and it had a you know a move to the upside. This blue day right here after the two down days, this this blue day right here is an expectation breaker to the upside. And that point, that's one way you can enter and set your stops at thirty. I'm big on whole numbers. We'll get more into this as we get to to more and more examples. But then again, now you have three ways, volume support, high volume close, whole numbers as three different ways you can enter after you see the highest volume ever. The next one, you know, is this is very, you know, above the 10 day, the stock builds a pivot, the volume is drying up. So pullback on low volume is a positive and the expectation is this will break out to the upside if and when it does do that. You can then enter again. Some call this a consolidation pivot, right? So you consolidate, the price consolidates and moves back on below average volume. And then price rises on this green bar on increased volume. And you have this line that you draw. You could draw horizontal, downward trend lines, uh, whatever it is that, that you know works for you that becomes your consolidation pivot and you enter the name in and this name all okay if we think hey uh it traded at 12 and it's moved to 30 um this is extended that's the mindset i used to have a very long time ago uh now so i used to think these were extended but then when i studied them i saw that momentum and when a stock trades the highest volume ever, things have changed dramatically to a point where more market participants are interested. And this name moved in 40, you know, in about 70 days, it moved. Then I took the high. I took the high of the HVE day and I took the high of that. 
all the way to here. It's 11 o'clock. In 70 days, it moved 119%. Now, if I didn't catch this, right? If uh, it completely fell off my radar and um, you know I, I didn't know any of this at that point in time, what you could do is you could still benefit from the fact that this is now a historical example in the markets that happened where your edge was visualized, your entry tactic was visualized, and your consolidation pivot entry tactic was visualized for you to even have a chance to be part of this 118% in 70, uh, 70 day type of move. So this combines, you know, I can't emphasize enough. So I have a whole watch list based on the fact that I, I look at, you know, the HV edge and I have a, a list of names that I track. The next thing, when they get on my watch list, I'm looking for entry tactics, which are three different ones. The highest volume close, the volume support, and the whole number. When I when I get these three combined and I see an opportunity, I then set you know very very specific uh, areas that I'm interested in where I can manage risk. Again, we go back to the type and logical stops. So if I were to place an alert on the high of this day, I can enter this name and place my stops, you know, a couple of cents below thirty, and that would be my risk. I know I've seen this before many 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 many, many times, uh, and then when this happens. I, I just naturally, you know, the back of your head goes into, you know, I've seen this, this is happening again, the market is good, you know, every every other factor that we'll cover later, but right now it's more important to kind of look at, whoops, entry tactic. So that entry tactic kind of triggers, you write the name and see how much you could extract. Now, this one never broke the rising 21 day all the way until here, right? We'll get into buy and sell rules later. Um, and, and, but this, you know, entry tactic after you see HVE, you need to, you know, write those down and see them visually for yourself. So Richard, any questions, yeah. follow-ups? I just want to, I just want to emphasize um, this entry tactic is one that's kind of my favorite, the the range breakout from a tight area. And we'll go over that specifically with diagrams and where to place your stop loss and all that. Uh, but also on, on a smaller time frame. This is where I actually bought it during this time. And on a smaller time frame, this is an undercut and rally of a range where we've got the inside day, which forms that tight range. And then if you look at an intraday chart of this, we get an undercut of that range below this low and a rally back through it. And that's that's where I personally bought the stock at Rye. I think you were earlier versus 30. So of these leading names, the key point is you have to identify them with the edges. What is the overall setup? And then you can use different uh, entry tactics based to, based on your style. Rye's got his style. I've got my style. I like buying strength more than Rye. He likes buying weakness, pullbacks. He's a little bit more tactical, all that. But uh, the key point is first it has to get on your radar. You have to have a setup. And then you apply the entry tactics that uh, you've you've studied and, and used and, and have many examples of uh, to get on that trade in, in that potential you know strong stock, strong trade. Yeah. And and this also comes down to there's a whole world of watch list uh, management, right? So I've noticed that when highest volume members have a closing range of less than, you know, the market relative to the market's closing range on that day, they seem to take a lot more time, right? They they need to consolidate a lot more. Pull up DLO on your guys' end if you have a platform up. Poor closing range. It's going to take time. It's going to consolidate. That's just the nature of if you go back and look at those type of names and when they have poor closing ranges relative to the market, they will kind of struggle, right? When they have good closing ranges and the market's bad, that's even better. That's going to get instant momentum to the upside because that's how price works. And as the market lifts, these are going to lift even more right away. So the nuances of how you trade these, uh, we could spend probably the next couple of webinars on that. But the first step, identify it place it on a watch list. Now this could be any any edge that you see in the market. Could be uh, estimates, could be growing sales, could be whatever. Place that on a watch list and track, right? How they act, track what they're doing. What, what I'm discussing here is I buy on weakness because I know that this name has to hold volume support for this to kind of go and do that, right? And when they do hold volume support, when they do hold hold numbers after the fact, you know, they work. And I have examples, you know, pins, snap, 
uh, CELH, this one, um, Koopa Software, uh, any any name, uh, Upwork, uh, like there's so many examples that come to mind where they gap up for the first time through 25, 30, they mature as a stock, they come back in, hold volume support, and then do this again and again, right? Uh, Arlo this year, uh, and we'll, we'll go into all of these, uh, but that's what's important, right? You define your entry tax and you kind of corner that name in. Hey, I see my edge. Now I need to corner this and really concentrate and make sure that somehow, some way, if the market is cooperative, I have these three ways I can enter this. These three ways I can define my risk at tight and logical and have tight and logical stops where you're betting. You're basically at the end of it, you're saying, I'm placing my bets that I've seen this before. I'm placing my bets, my outcome of a pot, you know, my, my, possible outcome of this you know being a positive return is very high i'm going to place my bet on this because i've seen this again i'm repeating this again and again in the market so that you know uh, that this is just one example and this shows you when the market's pointing in the same direction you've tracked the name you've done your homework you have three four you know different entry tactics to enter it there's no way in hell you'll miss even if you miss this there are going to be 30 others in the market. In a good market, right now, my, my HV watch list has 42 names, 45 names, right? So if I just catch maybe three of those, just three, three out of 40, 45 names, three out of 45 names, if I catch those, I'll be more than fine in terms of you know position sizing and getting into this to make a whole bunch of progress uh, yeah. in my portfolio. So- and, and coming back to mindset before we move on to the next slide, um, you know, I tried this stock a couple times in this base, I think through this consolidation pivot as well. And I got I, stopped I out too. or, or I, I, I didn't have a cushion before earnings. And then I missed this bar completely. And a stage one trader might give up on the stock and, oh, I missed the move. Um, yeah. But you, you have to recognize that uh, there's still power within the stock. The earnings are just reconfirming that power and then just apply the entry tactics. So don't give up based on small stop loss hits or, or trades that didn't really go anywhere. Stay sharp, stay focused, keep that name on your watch list, especially if it puts in uh, another whole new winning characteristic, uh, you know, edge like and that. So, yeah. I think that's a good point. Like, I, I know we all traded this area and it didn't do anything. It frustrated everybody, right? For the whole yeah. quarter. Yeah. At this point, like this day, it received the downgrade and the stock was scooped up. Uh, it held Expectation seven- breaker. Yeah. Yeah. And it held 17.5, this whole base. So there are so many, like, there's so much to talk about here. But if we just, focus, like, if you got chopped up, it's perfectly fine. If this mind, Richard nailed it. Like, at this point, I used to think, hey, uh, I should be up in here. And now this name is way up here at 30. And I should be in right around 15. I've completely missed this, right? And I would just get very negative about it. But if you just look at it, the real move, if you just position, if a, if a trader buys 100 shares here and 150 here, and you buy 100 and you hold, the trader with 150 shares will earn more money. So we'll get into the position sizing, how position sizing more at the right time will net you a better return than position sizing less at a time where you don't have the confidence to hold it through. So that, that's something that we could talk about as well. But um, what we're trying to drill down is the first two steps. Please have a process. Please manage whatever edge it is you have in the markets. Manage a watch list. Then corner that name in and make sure you have ways to enter. If this is going to double, all you have to say to yourself is, I know that stocks that exhibit this show this characteristic. If this is going to double, this is how I will enter this name. So that, you know, this is one way. This is the you know undercut and rally, uh, low cheat, consolidation, volume support, whole number support are all different ways of saying this. And if this name is going to go higher, I have these ways I can enter this with tight and logical risk to go with it. So I think with that, let's go into uh, yeah breakouts. Yeah, so this will be... Uh, I've got a few slides on range breakouts, which is the entry tactic that I probably use the most. Then there, there's a few different variations that I'll get into. Uh, but remember, this is always in the context of an overall pattern. And in this diagram, you know, this larger base is kind of the overall pattern. 
And then there, there's two potential entry tactics that I've highlighted where there's smaller ranges with smaller pivots um, that, and that's kind of what we're focused on today. Um, so getting into range breakouts, I define it kind of as a breakout from a short-term range and consolidation. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, how long should that range be? You know, ideally on, on a, for a daily range, one to two days, three days, two, three days is plenty, you know, subtle tightness is a really great tell and can produce some great moves again in the context of a larger pattern. We're not just buying two days of tightness up 10% from the pivot, right? We're buying it as the overall setup is completing itself and becoming more mature. Um, but I know a lot of you know swing traders and and day traders who might define a range as an inside day or you know a, a few hours of tightness. It all depends on your time frame and 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 your your style in the market. So this this is kind of a universal setup that occurs across multiple time frames. Um, so yeah, a range. What does that mean? That basically means a drift sideways to down in an overall constructed pattern. And ideally, volume is becoming very low at the same time. And that tells you that the supply and demand dynamics uh, are constructive and there's subtle accumulation at work. And there's kind of a lack of sellers at that point. And what, the, what does this allow you to do? It allows you to get an early entry before that base pivot, where often the stock feels extended going into that and then it bursts up 6% and you can't manage risk. But if you get in a little bit earlier up the right side of that base, you've already got a profit cushion going into that breakout so you can handle any kind of short-term reactions uh, to the downside. So there's a lot of benefits here. And if you miss that breakout, you can look for another consolidation, another range uh, that you can uh, position in, maybe not as much if, as if you caught it up the right-hand side, uh, but you can still participate in that move. Uh, again, uh, another benefit of this is it allows you to manage risk tightly often you know less than four percent three percent um if you do trade these these range breakouts uh using either the low of the breakout day or the low of the range as your logical stop whatever makes sense to you to say that this range breakout has failed that's where you should place your stop and we'll go through some examples as well and right I'll, I'll request uh remote control just so it's a little bit easier for for this section uh but that's pretty much it for you know setting the overall context of um of this pattern All right, cool. So moving on, um, where do you place your stops? I just kind of mentioned this. For me, you know, you can place your stops below the higher low. I'll often use the low of the breakout day from the range as my stop because I I'm, I'm trying to keep risk as as tight as possible. Uh, but I'm always thinking, you know, this tight area hasn't really failed, even if that one day fails, unless that higher low is violated. If that makes sense. Um, so you can also use a percentage below, you know, this pivot here. Um, I don't like using raw percentages just because, you know, I, I trade based on the actual price structure and some, some stocks are going to be wider. Some are going to be tighter. Um, so for me, it's more about, uh, the market structure and where does that say the setup has failed? Um, and again, keep your stops tight and logical, whatever makes sense for you and can keep your losses to a minimum. Uh, that's that's what you should use so in this example again we've got the overall pattern we've got a range that forms at the right hand side we've got the entry at this consolidation pivot or range pivot whatever you want to call it and you can place your stop loss right under this higher low because if you think about it if the stock reverses and breaks this low it just means the base at that point needs more time and then it might tighten up again and then that could be another constructive pattern that could just be a you know, a future setup that you could exploit even if this initial setup fails. Uh, then, you know, moving through, if it breaks out, then sets up another tight area. Uh, we kind of pretty much saw this with the CLH chart. Think of this as the earnings gap. Then we got the consolidation. And then we look for a range of tightness where we can buy through that pivot. And again, set your stop loss at the higher low or at the relevant even, even tighter stop loss if you would like to. And I see the question, what time frame are you entering on? Uh, personally, I, I'm trading mostly daily pivots, uh, but I will go down to a 65 minute time frame for my entries or even a 15 minute, but I don't go much lower than that. Uh, so again, it depends on your style. If you're more a swing trader, 
Uh, you're going to want to use primarily the daily and maybe uh, uh, a one, you know, one intraday setup. But again, especially if you're new to this, stick to the higher time frames, master the overall concepts, and then you can always improve and get a little bit tighter as you go. Um, and uh, I also saw a question, you know, when do I enter my trades? I enter when the stock's moving through the pivot. It could be 9.33. It could be later in the day. Um, I, I ideally want a profit cushion going into the end of the day. So that's something to consider entering later in the day. But um, you don't want to just be waiting for arbitrary, arbitrary numbers, uh, arbitrary times, like an hour, two hours after the bell. I won't enter until that happens. Um, there's different, you know, uh, strings of thought on this. Some people say, you know, uh, the first 30 minutes is, is amateur hour, and that could be 100% true for their system. Uh, Ryan, I know you say you, you enter most of your trades, you know, right after the bell or soon after the bell. It, it depends what works for you in your process and your time frame, right? Swing traders, day traders, they're going to do most of their trading in the first hour and last hour of the day. More position traders, investors might want to wait to see that confirmation because they're managing risk in a different way. They can open up their stops a little bit because their position sizes are a little bit lower. Uh, and then, you know, there's all those different ways of thinking, but uh, this, Ryan, is, this yeah. is where your, your creativity and how you can come up with a different way uh, comes into play, right? We could say that, Hey, uh, volume support works for me. Whole numbers work for me. Range breakouts work for me. These are, we're trying to show you guys ways that you can take these, but if, make them your your find your own way right um the hot the edge that we get you know richard keeps saying that the overall pattern is more important for you to even deploy any of these entries and stop losses so if you don't understand that part and you just go to a random stock and uh in the context of what you define an uptrend is not valid and you try to do that, you'll see failure, right? So in like take this and find maybe 50 examples of range breakouts that give you confidence. Uh, and then it, you're the subject matter expert at that point. You're, you're the, the person that I could go to. Like Richard can eye these instantaneously as he's flipping charts you need to eye these instantaneously for yourself for you to see success in them. What we're trying to say here and what we're trying to drive home is if you keep your entry tight and logical through that and when volume, especially when volume comes into play as well, right? There's low volume as it pulls back and then it goes through the pivot on bigger volume. If you visualize that instant instantaneously, your decisions will be so good and you'll be the master of range breakouts, right? Getting to the point of trading the first hour, trading the, the middle of the day, uh, the lunch hour, what I, I've, I've heard it all. It doesn't matter. So uh, if you're a day trader, right? Uh, you try to avoid lunch hours because liquidity goes away and the thought process is that traders go for lunch or whatever the case might be. Uh, I've seen people avoid the shake out the word shake out in the first 30 minutes. And I, my whole trading is based on the first hour. So I trade the first hour. I know I can anticipate the direction of the market quite well, right? Four out of 10 times is really good. Um, and if I do that every single day and every single week, I'm pretty well off. So that, that again is that works for me. Some people say it's amateur hour. My whole Trading is based on amateur art. Like it works for me. So I don't care what people call it. So it all take it, take it back to what fits and what works and how you creative you could be, right? Um, people call HVs pegs or EPs or n number of different names, but at the end of the day, it's just a big, big volume stick on the chart and they trade around it. So uh doesn't really matter. Take it back and you know, if you find 40 examples, 50 examples, these you could trade it better than the person that's just watching this and not following up with it after the fact. They will get they will not be able to eye the entry, but you can eye the entry because you trained your eyes for it. So 
Yeah, and addressing some other common questions that I, I see a few in the chat. Uh, personally, you know, I'm watching the price action first. Um, then if volume is coming at the same time, that's awesome. Uh, I, I use the, the volume run rate data point in deep view to assess, you know, in real time, you know, how is volume tracking versus the average? And it's great if that's 100%, 200%, 500% above average, but the price action move is really what I care about. Um, ideally, I want to see volume coming in later, but that, that's a secondary thing. And then also I see a few people um, trading full time. It's tough to, to buy these entry points and to use these entry tactics. Um, I would say it's definitely tougher, but make use of alerts. Um, Raya, I know you you trade from your phone. You, you almost prefer that. Um, well, my, my execution is based on my phone. Yeah. So Oliver Kell won, and, and Oliver Kell won the US Investing yeah. Championship trading from his phone. So use your alerts. Um, you know, in DFU, you've got hundreds of alerts at your disposal. Use those. Uh, take a quick glance at your chart if you can. And, and also you could use buy stops. Uh, sell stops. I did that when I was working at the Naval Research Lab. I couldn't watch charts during the day, uh, and I still found success with that. So, whatever style or or constraints you have, you can find a way to make it work. And in some way, those constraints can become an edge where you're you're not super worried about the the as Stan, Stan would say the wiggles and jiggles on the chart. Like that would scare you out. Um, so plan ahead and there are different yeah. ways too. Like yeah, Ross maintains end of day stops right so his whole uh his end whatever he enters then he has con he will see it through the end of the day and he won't make a decision uh in the middle of the day doesn't you know obviously if there's some news etc there's always exceptions to what we're saying but that's what works for him so um there there's so many different ways i think we can shift our focus a little bit to what we feel you know, if you take this, uh, this bigger pattern exists, you see a higher to low and you see range contraction, you could define a consolidation pivot over and over and over again. Even if you're working full time, people can place buy stops sometimes, right? People do place. So if you're concerned with price, you can place buy stops and then your execution is a day over day and you will find a way. Like our minds are creative enough and smart enough to work with this pattern. If this is the only pattern that existed, people would figure it out because that's how our brains are wired. We will figure it out. It's a matter of making sure you just do it again and again, and then you'll find some creativity in your thought process to allow you to make it work at the end of the day, so. Yep, so moving on to the next one. Um, again, uh, here's thinking about the overall context of where these range breakouts can occur. They can occur up the right-hand side of the base. Um, over here, you, you can they can happen after that base breakout, which which is basically what we saw with CLH, or it can basically a pull be a pullback into that overall area of interest. And we'll also talk about um, buying versus a level today and entry tactics for that. So think about the, where this this pattern can occur. These are kind of three main archetypes that you can you can think about. All right. So trading at range, there's kind of four different variations of this, which I'll get into. I primarily use more the, the third and fourth, which are, which are the next few slides. But these first two, uh, you can accumulate versus the lows of that range. Um, Rai, this is more kind of what you do versus a level, right? So you've got that whole number level. You buy as it's coming into that level. It's supported at that level. Your stop is right below that level. And uh, especially for people managing larger accounts like like Rye. This uh, work, yeah. yeah. This, this uh, I see a lot of people, hey, uh, I will make one buy and it works. One buys work, you know, I will make one buy and place one stop. But when you scale your account, it doesn't really work. It's super scary and you can't manage your risk with one buy. So I recently, a good example of this was Uber, where it just came back in on low relative volume post earnings the primary pattern was still intact so this line on you know uptrend consolidate right mm -hmm. so they came back in consolidated and it formed out a proper area if it was you know if it if it's going to break that range and close below it i would sell my entire you know position and and just go out continuously held continuously held and then it came out of that range on the top side but I accumulated over a span of like a week and a half where 
I didn't see anything wrong with the structure of this pattern. Price volume was below average. Price was moving in. S&P and the Qs were breaking the 50 days. This thing's holding this range. So I had relative strength. It already had the highest volume edge from the primary pattern. Then I combined those two things from an edge perspective. Entry tactic was buy the consolidation lows and accumulate your position bit by bit, but know your exit. So I knew, knew my exit never triggered and now you're up on the position. Now you could scale up, move, move up your um, stop loss, right? The stop loss can be a little bit above the, the lows of the consolidation. Now you're in the money, your mindset switches you know, from that to, can I switch to a 21 day rising? Can I switch to a 50 day rising as to how I will exit that position? But whatever it is, but, you know, barring a huge gap down and all of a sudden Uber makes no money overnight, which likely won't be the case. I will be in the money on this trade. And my psychology is positive. My mindset's positive. It's going to net me a positive return, a positive outcome. And that's where all that really matters at the end of the day. Right. So yeah, and we should we should dedicate a whole section of next the next webinar on stop loss management because I I know that's a big question a lot of people have and and people yeah. people that work full time and I think that's something we need to maybe make a, a bit of a focus on uh to in uh, webinars going forward um, that your execution can be based on you know the more you try to corner yourself the one buy one sell it gets a bit harder because you get you're shortening your execution time frame where you have to be present and look at certain factors for you to be effective in the market right um that's something i ran into as well like myself but if you had you know i'm going to piece myself into this and that's something nick is big on as well where he will accumulate a position you know a third, a third, or a third could be a fourth, a fourth, or a fifth, a fifth, 20%, 20%. Ross does this as well. He will accumulate position, but he will have on the top side a consolidation, but I'm going to finish it off when it moves through this consolidation on the top side, right? right? And that's where he routes. So maybe he has 20%, 20%, 20%, we're at 60. All of a sudden, this doesn't come back and breaks the top side. He rounds that position off you know, buys the additional shares uh, on the top side if he feels that this thing's not going to come back anymore. So then his average price is somewhere in the middle here. His stop loss is still very defined and he can then manage the trade uh, accordingly. So, yeah, perfect. So the, the second kind of variation is is buying tightness, anticipating the breakout through the top side pivot. Um, and you can place your stop, you know, below you know, an even even tighter, higher low entry, end of the day, you've got your stop here. Um, but the key thing is here, if your anticipation doesn't pay off, you got to make sure you honor your stop because, you know, if it just trickles back to the low of the range, you're you're now watching this level. Oh, if that breaks, I'll watch the 50 day moving average. You got to stick to your original plan, stick to the, the entry tactic that you were using and execute. Uh, yeah, Ryan, you want to add something there? Yeah, I mean, the, the uh, creativity of how to enter includes uh, some solid line in the sand on what my stop is, right? Don't get creative with stops. Basically, if you get creative with stops, then this will keep coming in and you'll just say, hey, on. It, it's holding the 21 day. Now it's holding the 50 day. Now it's holding the 65 day. Now it's holding the 200 day. And now your entry was here and, and the stock is all the way over here. And don't be creative with your stops follow what whatever it is that you know you came up with as a stop and and not make it non-negotiable basically yeah yourself. your stop has to make sense for the entry tactic you're using and, and stick with that uh no matter what price action does so yeah these are the first two variations i don't you know rye i know you use you use this one quite a bit i don't use this one too much um but you know i i know there's very successful traders who do that and they're they're valid ways of trading uh these ranges uh, so moving on, uh, range undercut and rally. This is, this is for all the people who are uh, complaining about stop hunters earlier. So, you know, a lot of people are going to place stops just below the range. Um, and during a strong market, you know, 
if that breaks, the, the stock's probably going to break down. But, you know, in a, in a whippier market where there, there's less liquidity, whatever, you might have a lot more moves like this. So in, in markets that aren't like 2020, this might be the more logical entry tactic and stop loss combination to use. Um, so here we've got an established range. It breaks below that range, stopping all these people out. Then it shows strength, rallies back through that low. You can enter right at that point. Place your stop loss at the low of the day or, or the low of this shakeout to that. Um, and then, you know, you've got an additional potential entry through the high of the range where, again, you can top off the position or even if it does a mini range and, and continues to rally, you can you can add on a little bit here. But the key thing is here, we've got a range that's established, a move below that range, but an immediate reaction back through that range. And you can enter right at that point through these lows. Uh, set your stop here. This will often be very tight, you know, often 2% even. Um, and then again, you know, it could form an outside day by breaking through these highs. That's an additional entry point. Uh, and you'd want to manage that accordingly with the stop. But this is really effective and it's a great way to be at a profit immediately and know if you're right or wrong. If it struggles at these lows, that's not really what you're looking for. You're looking for an immediate push higher back into the range and continue momentum to the out uh, to the upside the best result after you know a, a day opens we break the low uh these lows of the range and we rally back up the best result is we get an outside day closing right near highs on a pickup in volume that suggests that you know there are real buyers behind this and you've got a profit and ideally you continue higher uh, through this range so this is a really effective uh, setup that uh, you know people can use on a larger time frame where you've got a weekly base forming. These are weekly lows. We get an undercut and rally back through that. That's that's what this is commonly called uh, the shakeout plus three. This is also um, a version of this. You can use this on multiple time frames. I like it on a daily or intraday, but uh, I'll, I'll use it in the context of a larger pattern like this. It's very fractal. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the setup. Uh, Ryan, anything to add on this? Yeah, or, let's yeah. let's go over basically. Uh, let's say you consolidate the lows, right? And you have a twenty percent, twenty percent, twenty percent. So you you're accumulating shares versus a level. Now that level is broken. So you exit the position, right? That was your stop loss. You exit the position. You had sixty percent skin in the game, and you came out on the losing side. So that's one losing trade that you had. Then you see this happen. And again, the primary pattern is intact, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what you and, you know, the entry tactic that you employed here failed because it could be a, a function of the market. It could be a function of news, could be a function of downgrades, et cetera, whatever the case might be. Broke it. You followed your, your sell rule and you lost out on that position. But when you see this happen, it takes a very long time for you to come to the terms that what happened here is not personal. And what's happening here is the fact that, you know, it didn't work in this environment. It, you know, took you out, but you have to enter back in. It takes a very long time to kind of master that and not be kind of a sore loser, basically. Don't be a sore loser when you have a losing trade and you say, hey, I'm never going to trade this name again. And then you see a double and triple all the way up. Have a way. So what I have is, I call this the undercut, right? The undercut hold and hold is what I framed it. Now you can name it any which way you want, but it's for me, it's a way, for me, it's, a, just give me one second. Yeah, for me, it's a way uh, of, of getting back into a name that shook me out, right? So now I have a entry tactic, I, that entry tactic fails, but I have an other way, another way of entering that stock in, right? So it's like a, it's like a backup, backup plan. Right. I know this name is going to be a winner. I know that if the market is good and everything else lines up, I know that those things are going to the result in this being a winner. Right. If the market is under pressure, then I may be taken, you know, I'm taken out of this. But I I want to fix I want to corner this name after the primary trend is intact. I know I visualize this and my edge is there. So I'm all we're doing here, the difference between this. The difference between this and the difference between this is I have two different ways of maintaining a position into this name. 
because my probabilities of this name doubling and tripling are really, really high. So that's all we're trying to say here. So I call this the undercut. If it holds for a few days versus the low, then I enter right here and then see how this rallies up and out. If this does a we, then I kind of enter a little bit at the top of this prior consolidation because I feel more comfortable here than I do here at that point. But I have different ways of finding my way in uh, into a winner. So. Yeah, and I'll add, you know, on the weekly time frame, O'Neill again, this would this would be his shakeout. Oh, I'll go back. Yeah, this would be a shakeout plus three. He would add more shares if he got shaken out, because it's it's kind of reconfirmed the demand. And I do want to stress that you want to see kind of an immediate rally back up. You don't want to just be buying on a down day, down, 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 down. You want to buy on strength as it's as it's showing you that it's recovering. Often, you know, there'll be a gap down. And then it rallies immediately that that's the kind of buying pressure that you want to work with and we're getting into the weeds there uh but this is kind of the overall concept that um that you should think about and like rye said you know anticipation set up here failed your accumulation failed here that's fine if it sets up again and you you like this entry tactic you might not like this entry tactic but if you do you can use this to position that name again if you still deem that it's a high potential stock, a winner, the setup, the overall setup is invalid. Uh, but you don't just want to be buying a down day. I'm always wait, waiting for strength and for it to prove itself by pushing back through that pivot. Um, and and I just think a question kind of for people in the chat, maybe if you go, if you guys can put it, what kind of, I guess, entry tactics you use right now, right? Uh, in terms of... Uh, what what do you you know uh, have in your toolbox at the moment? So I think it would be really nice to see that. And what we're discussing here is just you know this could be one way for you to do it, but it would be really nice to see what people are using today. Yep. And uh, here's an example with Nvidia. A few weeks ago, it had a nice four or five day rally after this back to the highs of the base. But we've got this is a 15 minute chart. We've got the tight range that forms. In the morning, we had a gap down immediately in that 15 minutes. It rallies back through the lows of that range. You could enter right here, or as it re-breaks out through this pivot, you could also enter there. And that's a way to, you know, this tight range, a lot of people are watching that. There's a lot of stops here, stops at the low of the previous day as well. We take them all out and we see immediate response, higher volume pickup. So this is a real world, real world application of this exact uh, setup uh, that you can see and study. So um, this works the way, quite well. The way yeah, I would enter this is a little bit different. So the fact that we have a downtrend, right? And we see this break of this lower range, my eyes will go to 400. And I'll say, can I build a position versus 400 on this? The primary patterns intact, it's above this 21 day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? All of that checks off. I would build, you know, I would build a position versus 400 as close as so two, $2 on a $400 stock is less than, I don't know, half a percent, right? So I can build a really good position. And then I would add at the top of this consolidation when it breaks. So that's my second add. Now it's really gets going. So maybe I, I put a 30% position, then I top it off with another 30%. Maybe I don't have a full position. It doesn't have to be a full position all the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll have a, uh, basically a two thirds position versus my normal size I would have in a leader, I still make progress, right? I still make, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it's there. So this range breakout finds liquidity, reclaims people. You can enter here, you can enter here. There's two very valid ways of doing it. And then the third one for me would be like versus 400. So 20%, 20%, 20%, maybe I get 60 or I can do 30, 30, 30. I get 90% of my full position, and then we still see a rally. Um, again, primary patterns intact on the daily for you to even look at this and, and say that um, this is something that I'm watching for. Exactly. And yeah. getting back to the idea of the expectation breaker, the expectation when we gap down like this below a range is that we have a large distribution day where it follows through to the downside, volume picks up, uh, short sellers are piling on. People who bought in this range are getting stopped out. The the sentiment's very negative at that point. But some some people step in or big buyers step in here and accumulate. 
and there's an expectation breaker, a positive expectation breaker proven by the price action. And that's that's what all this is about, is looking for short-term expectation breakers that we can use to, to position in. All right. So the full range breakout, this is what I use. I use the, the undercut and rally as well as this one for the range primarily. Uh, we've got uh, the entry through the high of the range that had been forming, set the stop at the higher low, which, which could be the low of the day as well. Um, your entry is through the highs. Uh, you can also add a, have a follow on, you know, tightness and, and top off your position there. Uh, but this is very clear cut. Anybody who's familiar with base pivots uh, or trading breakouts, this is kind of the classic breakout, just likely on a smaller time frame. Uh, you know, within an overall constructive pattern, again, always with overall strong contacts and a stock that has high potential based on your system. Uh, setting stops, you know, right at the low of the day, low of the range, higher low, uh, whatever you want to use. And as it makes progress for you, you can move up your stop uh, to make sure this is a, a green trade. We'll get into the details of that in, in the next webinar. Uh, Rye, anything with this one that uh, you want to double down on? Yeah, so if if you're tracking a range breakout, have expectations for each day. And if it continuously breaks those, right, moving down on heavy volume, my expectation is it's going to continue lower. Hey, mm -hmm. it didn't. Right. Why didn't it do that? Well, that's the nature of the market. It just didn't. So now you say, okay, that's an expectation breaker to the upside. Now, you know, I'll continue to watch this range build out. I And, you know, I expect this this pullback okay it's on low relative volume my expectation is more sideways or down action it goes up right so as you track this you're working full-time your day trader your swing trader your position trader it, it applies because if you look at it on the daily or if you look at it on the weekly that that justifies your time frame but you are tracking how this is forming all of this range and, and the way I look at, you know, primary, you know, my, my, what, what I call the names that will make me money on, you know, cycle to cycle per se, I track those heavily. And when it's time to go at this point, this entry, when it's time to go, all my conviction for my position sizing comes from the fact that I've properly tracked it in this area. And I know this name is ready. This name is ready when the market's ready. This name's ready when the market's ready. This is ready to go. It breaks. Even though the market may be poor, I would still place a bet on this. Then the market turns around, it goes even more, right? So make sure you, it's not about, hey, I see a pattern. And when it gets to this, I will make a decision. But you could take a step back and kind of just track it day to day, right? A pattern, a pattern that forms over a, a span of multiple weeks and you're tracking it will allow you to size it so much better than you just say, I'm placing a line Whenever I get the alert, I get the alert type of thing. That works as well. You can place an alert and never look at it, but your conviction, if you want to make a whole bunch of like a large sum of money and you and you say, I'm going to put 25% of my account in this because I see how this is trading and it's so ready to go. That comes from tracking, you know, the the stock day to day. So yeah, and we'll we'll have some guidelines in a future webinar with position sizing because I think we mentioned this, this before. You have to earn position sizing, especially if you're a stage one, stage two trader. So just want to clarify that point. But um, also when it comes to alerts, how I would go about prepping for this trade, I'm tracking every day. I'm always doing my weekend, my daily routine, going through screens, coming up with the best ideas for the next day. Then I'm setting alerts before that ideal entry point. So I've got that that twofold. I, I've been watching it and I've got the alert, making sure it's on my screen as it's passing through that level so I can watch the price action, uh, see what relative volume is at that point. I uh, get that situational awareness where overall, how's my watch list performing today? How is the group performing today? How's the market doing today? All that adds to the conviction and, and adds to the setup. So yeah, that's pretty much it for, for this setup here. Uh, here's a real life example. This is CIX um, a few weeks ago. This is a 65 minute chart. Got extremely tight here. If we had RMV over here, it'd be going to zero. Um, this was the the former base breakout, or actually this is a lower uh, pivot range breakout. You can see this is actually an undercut rally of this range. Breaks on out. Earnings. Yeah, on earnings. Um, it moves higher, then pulls back, tightens up. 
barely any give back. It basically stays at at 80, you know, for for a few days here, really tightens up and pushes through. And look at that volume's not even higher. So if you're waiting for volume, you're late. Um, so find what works for you there. But you've got the clear pivot, nice move. And this set up a few of these uh, consolidation breakouts, uh, range breakouts over the, the past few weeks here as as the coal energy space has been kind of a leading group. Uh, Ryan, anything to add on this on this chart? No, I think it's uh, it's really perfect because the pullback, you know, the way it pulls back is on. You look at this volume right here. So we're on a 65 minute. I'm sure if you pull this on a daily, this pullback that we yeah. see is on relatively low volume and it would outperform the markets. It would hold a 10 day for, for sure as it comes back in. And on a daily, you would see that same setup where you have enough of a consolidation for you to define. And then if the, the setup exists on daily, you could go down to a 65 minute. Now you have this range built out. And if it breaks that range, you can you know put on a position. So yeah, we when we go over to examples, we should bring up this chart because you know, thinking about the overall context here, this green line is a base pivot. So it's consolidating versus the level. And this this is another thing that I want to stress today. Confluence of levels is super, super important. So this tightness is happening against a key level that a lot of market participants are watching and accumulating versus. So we've got the overall context that just broke out of a base, pulled back into that base pivot, consolidated tightly, and then had a range breakout on a lower time frame. On a day, on a weekly chart, it makes sense. It's it's a pullback to the pivot. On a daily chart, it makes sense. It's a it's a pullback on lighter volume against that pivot. And on a sixty five minute time frame, the entry tactic is valid. So that's really key. So yeah, we'll definitely bring this chart up. Uh, let's see. All right. So the next one, oops, reversal. Um, I, this is developed by Larry Williams. Uh, I learned this from JT over at ticker monkey. It's another very useful setup. It's, it's a variation of the undercut and rally. This is a daily chart here. We've got a gap below this low, a rally below that low. So again, it's, it's basically, yeah, it's the undercut and rally setup. Uh, we've got immediate traction, strong move, and it finishes with an outside day. Um, Airbnb did this a few days ago where it had that gap up, it ran, formed a range, had an oops reversal. So that's one way to, to have been positioned in that name. So yeah, I actually say that. Uh, so I'm, I'm reading my own mind. An undercut and rally on a shorter time frame or a higher time frame on a daily, it's a gap below the yesterday's low and rally up through that level. That is the pivot point for this setup. Yep, yesterday's low is the pivot point. I'm really reading my own mind. Um, it should burst through the low. We talked about that immediate traction, immediate momentum. That's what we want to see here. And it's best used in a strong stock and a strong group where there's confirmation of a rally. Again, stack the odds in our favor, overall context, overall setup. You don't just buy this at 52 week lows in a stock which, which is, you know, has terrible earnings, you know, no story, you know, uh, everything's a fraud. You buy this in a strong stock that's a potential market leader that you can see that there's runway to the upside. Uh, and it's an expectation breaker again, because we're expecting with this gap down below this range that we continue lower. Instead, the opposite happens. Uh, we rally strongly back through that low. So yeah, that's, that's the oops reversal. Definitely a really nice entry tactic um, for, for those daily timeframes. Um, so here it is in real life. Oh, here's Airbnb. So we have a gap up forms an inside day, gap down below this low as well as the the prior days low immediate traction and had a nice rally for a few days gain you know it went from 140 to basically 150 uh, and then it did have a pullback obviously the market uh, has been a little bit uh, shakier here but it's holding uh, but that's that's kind of the short-term entry tactic that you can use in an overall pattern and overall base up the right hand side above the moving averages uh, that you can use to position in a name such as this uh, right. Anything to add on the on the oops reversals? No, I think yeah. It's just you know you're cornering a name that's now seeing a reversal in you know its primary trend is trying to reverse to the upside. The 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 big volume that it saw on earnings puts it on radar for a lot of people. If I think it was an S and P inclusion, it wasn't earnings. This one, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So included in the S and P caused this volume. So now. There's some sort of catalyst to move price, but 
it, the, the the primary you know setup is starting to go from this downtrend to this uptrend now you could be somewhat employ these bullish uh entry tactics for you to catch momentum to the upside so yep perfect and then uh here's a little bonus for everybody who stuck around with us which there's a lot of you guys here which is awesome uh so the opening range breakout uh this is a tactic that's commonly used i think day traders love this but it can be used for swing traders and even position traders on that initial buy uh, a lot of people use a similar tactic to trade earnings gaps on day one um, they'll wait for a five minute opening range breakout or a three minute opening range breakout whatever it is one minute um, and basically it's a pivot breakout on a short term time frame where we've got a gap up or gap down uh, we form a range and we break through that range i included this one on purpose this was tesla a few days ago because the initial breakout the initial opening range breakout fails and this is the reality of trading especially intraday time frames uh th it then reforms holds the anchored rewap from that day and re-breaks out through that pivot so this is a common variation you know this one isn't going to magically work every time that's not trading you might have to try it a few times um and this one ends up working and and this is the Tesla uh, gap up that I think ultimately the stock was up 10%, whatever, on that day. Uh, so definitely a very powerful um, entry tactic that, that that is a lot more short term time frame than most of the stuff uh, we're talking today. Uh, and this works best when the whole market is rallying uh, either on a gap up or on a gap down. And I uh, see it, you know, on the stop loss, let me ask you guys, where would you place your stop? Where, where would this set up if you enter here? logically fail so sean says low of the day uh for an entry point like this low of the day you could do that depending on your time frame uh for me there's a tighter entry uh below the pivot low um so i i think that means yeah the higher low so robbie says higher low so yeah i would place it below this low here or you know if you're being super tight the low of that breakout day so you, you know for the context of the of the setup the time frame you're on you want to apply it uh, a logical stop for that time frame. Um, but again, overall setup matters. This is the up the right hand side. A lot of people are watching this stock. It was forming a tight range and then it made this move. So the overall setup is super important. I know we're looking at intraday time frames, uh, but the weekly and daily chart have to be in alignment before you even consider this stuff. Uh, Ryan, anything to add on this? No, I think it's a good exercise. We should do more of these examples. So yep. Let's keep yep. going. And John says below anchor view app as well, 100%. That would be that would be very valid. A lot of institutions will will purchase and you can see this trended all day above that. Um so that could be your trailing stop on on intraday time frame. All right. So getting into uh trading a pullback to support and this could be a you know, support can be a key level such as a base pivot. It could be the first test of the 50-day moving average. It could be the first test of the 21 uh, day moving average, 21 EMA, whatever it is, you're pulling back to a key level that a lot of market participants are watching. Um, and ideally this pullback is constructive. It's, it, the, it's a drift lower versus a sharp drop. Um, you're seeing decline in volume overall, as Ryan mentioned on the Uber example. Um, and you've got the, the key points here. Um, when a stock retests a key level and responds positively, we want to see that positive response. Um, this can be a key moving average. Uh, you've got a few other examples of key levels. A confluence, again, with this confluence is really important. If a base pivot is lining up with the 50-day moving average, that's added evidence that more market participants are going to be focused on that level and potentially going to accumulate at that level. So you always want to be looking for that confluence and paying attention to that. That just adds the probabilities. Um, how it pulls back matters. As I mentioned, we want to drift lower into that level. Uh, it may undercut that level. These aren't magic lines in the sand where the stock has to obey this rule where it stops right on the dot. Uh, there's likely going to be some wiggles and jiggles, to quote Stan Weinstein again, um, around that level. And you have to be prepared um, and position size accordingly if you do put on a, a position. Uh, watch for a rally after the pullback, you know, Brian Chan and strength after the dip, all that stuff. Um, so here in this diagram, let's walk through this. 
This dotted line is the key level that we're watching. This could be a base pivot, moving average, as I mentioned. We're pulling back in. Um, some traders, I know uh, Charles Harris, Ross has mentioned this as well. As it's pulling back to that area, they might be starting to put on a little bit of size, you know, a pilot position to see how it acts. But you can also wait for strength after a bounce. It might not hit that level. It might undercut that level. It might come right at that level and bounce. But always be prepared for a little bit more consolidation, some more shakes. So if you do buy shares as it's pulling back, you have to buy an amount that you're willing to give it a few percent. And you always have to have a line in the sand, uh, whatever entry tactic you're using. So here we pull back, undercut that level as well. Uh, you're either stopped out on these entries if you did that, or uh, you size these accordingly that you've got a line in the sand, maybe a few percent below the level. It rallies back through. You could buy strength as it's rallying back through this level or as it rallies back up. It forms a tight range above that level, just above. You could enter there or enter after uh, this pivot here. So there's a lot of different ways to trade these pullbacks uh, depending on your style. Um, these are just a few ways, but the key thing is, you know, be open-minded for more shakeouts below that level position size accordingly and and don't feel the need to go all in at once and then you get stopped out and then you know you get disappointed you you had a loss and and you take it off your screen and then it tightens up again versus that level and then rallies five percent and, and closes with a hammer candle right after testing the 50 days so um rye anything to add on this because i think this is uh, a really important slide for for people to to focus on yeah, in, in terms of, you know, examples of this, uh, the first pullback to 21 and 50 is what I, I, I like a lot because uh, those seem to be levels that are respected. Um, the amount of volume I tend to give uh, on a pullback matters more to me than on a breakout of a consolidation pivot. So if it's coming back in or the slope that, you know, the slope of um, how is it stairs staircasing down or is it taking the elevator matters and you could uh, quantify or uh, visually um, see that on the pullback that matters a lot um, how how it you know what the name is is it an nvidia versus a smci right nvidia i would give a lot more of my money to than a secondary leader in that space it tends to matter a lot more um, there's all these very little, you know, things that add up to how you can approach a particular name um, as well. So it, it, regardless of the market that you're trading, right, if, uh, if you're in India and uh, names that make, you know, a, a, you know, cement or something uh, are, are big leaders in India uh, at the moment or something in the construction space, right, because they're building rapidly. Uh, then that matters as well. Or if you're in the Canadian markets and at, at some point in time in the Canadian markets, the cannabis names were the top ones. And you would you need to be in the right group for you to stack your probabilities. And when we get into position sizing, probably not today, but uh, in you know future webinars, that matters uh, a lot more. So I, I, everything that you, that you said there applies um, I think when we talk real names, it will be much easier to for people to kind of get into. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and here on the next slide, I kind of highlight you know the stops here. Uh, you know, again, where does the setup fail for you? That's what you have to decide for yourself on each of these entries. So that that's the key key concept that we want to always come back to. And again, we're not just doing this in isolation. This this is an overall strong stock. The overall trend is up. And like Rice said, this this is really good. The first pullback to the 50 or 21 EMA, uh, 10 day even. A lot of people trade that after the breakout. Um, we're looking for a strong stock overall pattern. And then this is short term weakness, which is constructive still. And then we're looking for an entry tactic to apply once we see strength after that pullback. Uh, so here's an example with Uber to kind of cement things. This is... Um, a daily chart this is prior in the year we've got a base that forms super powerful up the right hand side straight um up from the bottom um as ross would say uh it it stutters at the the base pivot a little bit and you know maybe because it's straight off the bottom we get a little bit more consolidation 
uh, rise learning coding or something in, in his free time. Uh, let me exit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, but yeah, we, we form a consolidation here. It tries to move higher. It doesn't, but we get another pullback to this very key level, the base pivot. That's what we're focused on here. And look at that. We've got a little bit of confluence with the 21 EMA coming to pretty much that same level. And we did have a prior pullback to the base pivot. So that it's could be actionable top. as well and here as well. But we're going to focus on this one. We, we've given it a little bit more time. It's a little bit more mature where the 21 EMA has caught up to price. So now we've drilled down to a 65 minute time frame. This was the failed move higher. Uh, this was the prior pullback that was also actionable. And you can see, you know, if you traded this pivot, it would have worked in the short term. But we ultimately still get a pullback. Uh, volume isn't huge. Uh, we see an undercut of the base pivot, this blue dotted line here. We've got smaller ranges here. Um, and then we've got, you know, the entry tactics, the, the break through the range and move higher. You can see all the volume is coming in blue here. And it's very strong off this level, but we do get some wiggles and jiggles near that base pivot. So obviously in real time, it's not going to be as clean as a diagram, but it's about having proper expectations, understanding there will be uh, those shakeouts and, and moves higher or lower. And that's why it's completely fine to wait for you know confirmation that it's going higher because then your confidence can be higher. But people who want to manage risk tighter and, and try it more times will will trade down in here versus if you want to, you know, really position once you might wait for this breakout through the clear level, which on a lower time frame is a stage to break out uh, from stage analysis. So that's it for the 65 minute time frame. Here's the 15 minute time frame. Again, we've got the clear level here and the breakout through that. And we push higher from that point, but you can see how it's found support at this base pivot. And even going back, um, right. Can you go back one slide? for me yeah you see demand come in at this base pivot and then we see demand come in here you're learning the nature of the stock and then that's when you drill down when the patterns mature the entry tactic is ripe and you either trade you know lower pivots you're accumulating versus that level or you're buying through that pivot and uh, that's how you position the name to see if that pullback will work um, and ultimately it does. And, and I think we'll, we'll go through some live examples now, and maybe we can start with Uber to, uh, drill down on that example, leave a little bit more. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's get into this. Yeah. And while we're doing that, um, leave in the chat, uh, what's been your feedback on today's session so far? Have you enjoyed it? Uh, what's been, um, any key takeaways that you've learned? Uh, can we start? Yeah. Can we start with Uber, uh, so far? So yes, drilling back down, let, let's scroll back a little bit. Uh, show that base that was forming right here. So here's the high, here's one pullback, here's the pullback that we talked about. Um, and from that point on, we rally strongly. And then, Ryan, I know you were trading this back in here where it had some more pullback setups, but yeah. it was really nice confluence between the base pivot as well as the, the kind of intermediate term moving average. Um, and this one ultimately worked. Again, you might have to try it a few times. Uh, don't fear that, but it it ultimately positioned you nicely in a name that had been showing a lot of strength, has fundamental catalyst behind it, um, is in a relative strength phase. All the edges that we've talked about, everything comes together here. And then the entry tactic is the last piece of the puzzle. Um, so yeah, that's that's let's most of it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, let's, let's, let's drill down a little bit into... Uh... Here, I'll give back your screen. You can control from this point. Yeah. There you go. So this is uh, the fun stuff. So we have uh, this. Oh, stock. we're not done, guys. I see some people saying. Uh, yeah, we're not done. We're not. We're, we're, we're not done. done. We're, we're, we're about to stuff. go through a bunch of live examples <laughs> to bring everything home. So th this is this is where the application comes into to play. So yeah, because uh, real life about, real life is different than diagrams. Uh, yeah. So but the concepts are what's what's important. So we have this earnings gap up that we see. Right. Let me make this a little bit thicker. And uh, people will say that you have this earnings gap. We have this stuff. Right. We have a big bar, but it has a poor closing range. So I make an observation. Right. I've traded hundreds of gap ups uh, now in many different market cycles. And I said that if the rate poor, if it has a poor closing range and it doesn't look like this type of closing range, it's going to struggle. So my expectation at this point is I set an alert. 
and I see and attract this stock. I can add it to my high volume list that I have up here. I always do, right? And and then I track the stock. What does the stock do? The stock consolidates and doesn't give me any reason to enter because it's pulling back in. Even though the pullback is on roll low relative volume, I need some, what we said, two things, tight and logical entry areas where I could define my risk. The name is not acting well. It's gapping down randomly. It's pulling back in, right? And uh, and it's not acting too well. So at this point, yes, I have this on my HV list, which is my high volume list. Uh, and I keep track of this stock throughout this cycle. If the stock were to come back in and just completely go down from this point, there will be a threshold to keep my list high quality. I would remove this. And if it were to do an HV again, I would bring it back, right? So all of this that we talked about, we see an edge, the closing range is poor. We start tracking entry tactics of how we can enter this. If this name were to do this, if this name were to go up like this, then we were interested, right? If this name is going to consolidate and, and not act well, we're not interested. We can't define what we spoke about today, which is the entry tactic. So let's fast forward to May 2, 2023. The stock does a gap up, has good closing range, right? DCR closing range that we spoke about in our last webinar. And sorry about the the drawing. I don't have my tab uh, pen here, but the DCR is good. And the name is acted well, and this is the highest volume that it's seen since last earnings. So what do we qualify this as? It is HVLE, right? Highest volume since last earnings. That's the edge uh, that I am going to employ here. So this is my edge on this name. Good closing range, highest volume since last earnings. That's my step one for anything that you do. Doesn't matter. You don't want to use HVs. Don't use them has to be some sort of primary edge for you to get see a stock and start main, you know tracking it for for entry. The next thing that we talk, spoke about is we have this HVC, which is the highest volume close. We could have volume support right on this name. Uh, and we can have whole number uh, levels, which in this case was also 35, which I would be interested in. I have these three ways of entering this name or the the other one is our consolidation pivot. Right. So there are four ways after I visualize my edge. I visualize my edge on the charts. I see a good closing range. I have four different ways I can enter this name. Right. What am I doing? Why do I have four different ways? Why do I have five different ways? Because I know that the probability of this name moving to the upside is very, very high. And I want to find different ways to enter this name to have an opportunity to be a part of this 50, 55 percent run in a matter of three to six months. Right. So that's kind of what we're doing um, over here. So entry tactic wise, Richard, what what Richard spoke about is right here. It aligns with this prior base pivot. So confluence of levels is one way that you can master how you can enter a name. That's one way. Confluence of levels. The second way that you can master this is that this, you know, you look at the market here. The market was turning around. There were many, many, many PLTR was in HV at the same time. There, there were four to five different names where risk appetite in the market was high, and you could use HVC, even if you got a 20% position, 25% position, uh, doesn't matter, relative to your whatever your full size is, you would have made something. So next, I will go and clear all these drawings because it's getting messy. Uh, Richard, if you want to do that as well, I really want to focus in on, if I didn't get here, a lot of people tend to complain right? I visualized my edge. I didn't enter over here. You missed it. Let's just say you missed it, right? That's not an excuse for you to stop tracking a name. A name that will run 40, 50, 60% will give you multiple entry points. So this could be a consolidation pivot that you define, right? We see an attempt above this consolidation. What is a consolidation? A pullback, a pullback on volume, right? And you expect the price to go back up at some point in time. It doesn't have to be at this point. It doesn't, it could be somewhere over here. It could be somewhere over here, but you've defined this consolidation at the very least. What you're saying is if, and when the stock moves above this, I will have some sort of interest because I've visualized again, my edge on this name, right? So let's clear that once more. 
And then I have one last point to make here is the fact that, you know, this comes back, uh, comes back in, holds the levels, but I kind of entered over here, right? Uh, if you miss this area, if you miss this day, perfectly fine. Entered here, you still get a good run out of this name. Now let's cover the pullback a little bit. So the pullback, what, what is the pullback? We spoke about, you know, the stock has now run up uh, quite a bit. So the stock has run up quite a bit, right? It's gone from 36 to 50. That's a good run, right? If you got any chunk of this, you're pretty, you know, you're, you're well off. Now the stock pulls back in. We get the catalyst for the pullback is earnings. So we got, you know, pullback on earnings. But the fact that this stock started to consolidate, so this could be your range breakout that we spoke about today. The stock has now formed a top side range and a, and a bottom side range. And when this breaks out right here, could be an entry point. It comes back and retests, shakes you out. You got to buy it back. And then you're still in this name. Why are you tracking this stock in the first place? There's an edge you visualize. The primary trend of the name, the primary trend of the name is still to the upside because we have rising MAs. And this pullback, this pullback that we see is on low relative volume. If this pullback had the same sticks as we see over here, I would not be interested in accumulating stock in this range. I would then say, hey, I'm anticipating, given the pullback is on high volume, my anticipation is this thing is going to take the elevator down and not the staircase that it took right here. But the staircase that it did take down, the volume start to go down at the same time. So then at that point, I'm kind of, so we have a range being built, this stock consolidate, consolidate. And if you see from a relative perspective, relative to the market, you'll see that the RS line is starting to go in an RS phase at the same time. What that means is the market was pulling back, breaking the 50 day, breaking the 21 day, breaking the 10 day, the S&P and the Qs, but Uber refused to break its range. And when a stock does that, that's our second edge that we spoke about. That's the relative strength edge. If I were to magnify this a little bit, just for folks to see, as we consolidated, the stock was exhibiting relative strength. As we broke out, the stock then also, this is on a 21-day basis, stock also exhibited relative strength. Now we've combined two edges. We have our visualized edge that we saw from this gap up. Now the stock is showing relative strength. The primary trend is to the upside. Whatever you want to call it, at the end of the day, it pulled back on low relative volume and built a range. Range, it's something that basically says, we're, we have some sort of direction to take. That direction could be to the upside or the downside. And if that is downside, we'll get a range breakout to the downside. And all of these people that anticipated baby positive, they will be trapped and short sellers can step in that could accelerate the price action to the downside or the opposite of a range breakout is to the upside. And anything, anyone going short in this range will also be going long. And anyone on the top side of that range that is bullish will also be also be going long, driving the price action to the upside. So that's just one example that combines a whole bunch of different aspects that we kind of theoretically talked about. Pull back on low volume, range ranges being built, relative strength starting to show and visualizing our edge, and then eventually our entry tactics with consolidation pivots and, and you know n number of entry tactics that you could have as long as you first step to anything is getting this on your radar, then figuring out different creative ways to maintaining a position in a name. So, uh, Richard, any questions? That was just one example. We have a, a few more that we'll go through. No, I, th I think that was great. Um, I think uh, it'd be great to go through some uh, HVC examples as well to to really dive into um, the HVC as well as volume support, so we can cement that for people. Yeah. So let's uh let's put this away. Uh, so let's take a look at this one, right? So we have Arlo. Uh, the company is in a downtrend. Company is in a downtrend. Uh, would it be on my radar over here? No, 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 and no, right? I don't even know that company exists. I have no idea what to do. I'm not concerned. As long as it remains in a downtrend, I'm not concerned, right? So one of my criteria is, is 
technically it has to be above the moving averages for me to act on a name. So that's one thing uh, that, that, you know, that's how I, I kind of function the markets. So the other thing that we want to do is, so we see this bar pop up. My curiosity of Arlo, my uh, fundamental thesis, whatever you want to call it, are all driven uh, by the fact that this name is now seeing a 16 million volume bar and it's switching from a downtrend, a downtrend to an uptrend in the markets, right? And when it switches from a downtrend to an uptrend in the markets, I'm most interested. And this is my HV edge, right? So this is my HV edge. This is the highest volume ever that Arlo has ever seen in its history. And this is the primary reason I should have this on my head with high volume. Watch this. I have visualized my edge. That's my first step. And my next step to all of this is to find a way to enter this name. And how do I find a way to enter this name? So we discussed a few entry tactics. We had HVC, which is very easy way to say that if the stock is above the, the close of this high volume bar, I am interested, right? And if the stock is below the close of this high volume bar, I need to wait for a new consolidation to happen. That's one entry tactic. The second one, which I love the most, is to correlate a whole number versus what's happened on the HB day. So this stock moved from about four bucks to about five and a half. And dollar five is an area uh, I'm always interested in, or I could place my risk versus dollar five. So I can accumulate stock if it were to come back in on a pullback, I would be interested as this stock comes back in, I can accumulate my position versus five. So this stock, what it did was after the big volume gap up that we have, this stock came back in and consolidated tightly versus the dollar five mark. So this one consolidated tightly versus the dollar five mark. And then we see this tightness, you know, two days of action where the stock is coming back in on increasing volume. And we see two inside days. And this was what, you know, Richard would define as a reversal, right? To the upside, two tight days, break break above um, break above the range. Just give me one second. Unlimited phone calls coming through. Um, break above the range. And then you could see that the stock moved up to the upside. So getting back to the, the point of this webinar, what's the point of this webinar? to identify entry tactics. What are the entry tactics? HVC is one of them. And the whole number of five, I could place my risk versus and I could accumulate a ton of stock uh, based on this HVE. How, why do I have the confidence to do this? Why do I have the confidence to do this? Because I've seen this in AEHR. I've seen this in CDLX. I've seen this in any name that has been in this range and seen the HVE. And I told this to the guys when we have our internal meetings, I said, this is our next AEHR. This is our next AEHR because it looks exactly the same. The pattern is exactly the same. We know we've seen this. We've studied this. There's no reason we should not be bullish. And what happens is this happens in March and this thing goes from five to 10. Now you say, hey, I missed this name completely. That's perfectly fine. But your edge is working and your entry tactics are working. That should give you immense confidence that when this happens, again and again and again in the markets over the next decade, just maybe, just maybe you'll catch one of the 10 that happens. And even if you catch one, you'll make so much money that you know all you're doing is repeatedly visualizing your edge, repeatedly visual visualizing your entry tactics and continuously executing upon the same framework that we have. Now, this name also had another you know subsequent uh, HVLE, which is the highest volume since last earnings on this. That's our that's an edge that we have. We can continue to do the same thing. HVC, right? Comes back in, holds HVC. The stock then gaps up on another, uh, gaps up above that. So we could accumulate stock versus this level. That's and again, HVC is an entry tactic to the highest volume since last close edge. And this stock continues uh, its move higher. So we see the journey of how this is going. It's all started here. It all got on our radar here. We employ our entry tactics and this could be one of the names. It doesn't have to, you don't have to trade Arlo. There are so many names that do the same thing, but this one moved from five to about 10 bucks, which is basically a double. Right. So that's I've got a question. Um, yeah. 
after the HVE or the high volume edge, um, do you have a kind of ideal range for the consolidation uh, period? So this one is about, you know, two weeks long, pretty much. Is there, you know, an ideal range that you found works really well? So if, if when we say consolidation, this is consolidation, right? This. For me, this is a consolidation pivot, right? A consolidation entry tactic over here that happens. And this is the HVC entry tactic. And this is the whole number entry tactic. So I've cornered, I can enter n number of ways. Or we could do this, you know, two, two inside days in a row, reversal to the upside that you spoke about as well. So it, the, the number of days for consolidation could be, for me, I would say three to five days would be a good time frame for the daily. And on the 65 minute, that's a lot of bars that you could look at as it consolidates, right? You could draw the same thing on the 65 minute. It would, it would be your whole chart. Uh, but yeah, three to five day minimum. Uh, if it's like, if it goes up, let's just visualize this. So if it goes up, right? And I have a high and it has two really close inside days. FSLY did this. Two really close inside days and it just goes. I'm still buying that. Even though I said three to five just now, I just kind of, you know, I'm contradicting myself because uh, the, a stock comes to mind where I completely missed FSLY. <laughs> So, so it depends, like it's the situation that you're in. You never want to say never, I am going to only buy three to five days. And then now you're sitting there with a breakout had perfectly pulled back in, right? Dry up in volume and it goes through that volume. There's no reason to just sit there and, you know, be stubborn about it. You could put on a position, maybe a smaller one. If you say, Hey, I'm, I'm waiting for a three, five, three to five day consolidation. I'm going to put on a smaller position here and then this thing rips at least you have some some skin in the game at that point so three to five days is ideal depending on the hv type of consolidations uh, usually you'll see maybe a day or two like this and then you'll see a rip right through or the the poor closing range ones will see more of a pullback come back in maybe undercut the volume support and then they will build a consolidation plus a HBC on the top side. So there are many different situations that happen. But the idea is if you just start visualizing these, you will see different ways and your mind will take over and you'll be very creative as to how you want to approach these. Um, maybe not, you employ none of these uh, that we discussed today and you come up with your own way. And that's perfectly fine as long as there's potential for these to double. Right. That's all that really matters. Yeah, I know you've been tra you traded uh, SPLK recently from uh, a high volume yeah. day. Do you want to walk through that trade and kind of your entry point and thought process throughout that? So SPL this one, yeah. So I, I this one was uh, funny because Ross was adamant and then I was stubborn, but uh, it's funny. So this one. So let's let's discuss this. So from a psychology perspective, I think it's a good lesson. So if you look at the broader pattern that Richard talked about, right, the broader pattern is going to dictate some of this stuff. So what is the broader pattern here? Uh, if you guys want to put that in the chat, the broader pattern is this thing's not going anywhere for a very long time, right? We have a base that started in August 2022. It's, it's done absolutely nothing in a market, you know, that is pretty bad, was pretty bad in 2022 and early 2023. And this is just consolidated. So we have a bigger base that's being built. Now, my side, for, from price action and psychology perspective, I said, this thing is gapping up at the top side of a six plus month base, right? So the gap up that we see right here, this is the same day NVIDIA gapped up, by the way. Everybody's watching NVIDIA, right? We opened at the high of the day. The NVIDIA day, we opened at the high of the day. Everybody's watching NVIDIA. Splunk also reported earnings. Nobody's watching it. This thing has a closing range of the market had a closing range of zero. You guys can pull this up and compare the cues for yourself. The market had a closing range of zero and Splunk was accumulated all day. And this was the highest volume in over a year. So what's my edge? What's my edge? HV1. That's my edge, right? This is the highest volume in or ever or uh, in one year on Splunk. The second is the DCR is above the above the market. The daily closing range on this name is above 
the closing range on the market where the whole world was just watching in media. Nobody really, you know, cared about anything. The third thing that I see is that it's gapping up at the top of a six month range. And I said that, you know, I was pretty convinced on this day. I said, there's, if this name is going to maintain this character, if this name is going to maintain this character of pulling back in quickly, pulling back in quickly, rash, you know, gap up and gap down on this earnings. It should have done this on, it should have done that on this day. I have two edges at play now. I have the HV1, which is the highest volume in a year, and I have relative strength. Those are the two edges that we spoke about in our last webinar. Those two aligned right here, combined with the fact that it's gapping up at the top of its six-month base, I said anybody that's short is trapped. Anybody that looks at relative strength is bullish. Anybody that looks at the HV edge is bullish. Three forces are aligning as to what I see winners exhibit in the market again and again. I put on a position on this name and this, you know, ran for a few uh, days from about, you know, here to here, but it gives you, you know, all, all I did was visualize what I have HV one second is relative strength. I have two edges that dictates my position sizing as well. And the fact that everybody in this area is now trapped will short, you know, will also cover and this name then goes for a rally. What are the entry tactics? That's what we're here for today. So let's cover uh, some of the entry tactics on this, very easy. One is HVC, that's you draw your HVC, very easy to draw. And the second is volume support. When you when you go in on this frame and you prepare for the next day, that's when the market's closed. You, you don't have an excuse, work full time, whatever, whatever you could spare. If you can't spare 30 minutes of your night looking at the markets and you want to make this a profession, then I'm sorry, it's just not going to happen, right? So volume support, HVC, those are two things that you can look at. We have HV1 as our edge and we have relative strength as our second edge. You corner this name, you corner this name, this thing works, it triggers your entry and you get in right over here at the HVC and you get in right over here to your volume support. I accumulated my position, saw this through. And what did I do? I randomly sold right up here. I said, enough is enough. I got enough what I, you know, as I expect this name to start acting like this a little bit up here. And I just sold, we'll get into sell rules later, but that's the entry tactic portion of it right over here, the first two bars. So that's Splunk. I mean, do all of them work this way? No, uh, but did I visualize my, my edge? Did I see my entry tactic through, right? Yes, I did. And did I repeatedly execute on what I see from an edge and entry tactic perspective? Yes, I did. Did it have a positive outcome? Yes. Did it, should it, you know, should it always be a positive outcome? No. Three out of 10 times this works, you'll make a whole bunch of money. And the seven out of 10 times it doesn't, we'll, we'll kind of cut into your, your gains that you make on this. But over a series of trades, if I see this 40, 50, 60 times over the next five to 10 years, I will execute the same way I did and I will see a positive return. And that's really all that matters. So um, that's Splunk. I mean, we could go to app, same thing from an HV perspective. Uh, CDLX looks very similar to Arlo, but this one- all right. can, you, can you talk quality. about how you uh, manage risk on your buy in SPLK? Where would you place your stop on, on an HVC buy? So my stop in this case, was if we zoom in and really look at this, my stop was just here, right here. So I said, this day is, is such a defining day for this stock. Like the market was down, Nvidia was down. It's a character change was a little bit. Out. Everything was sucked out of the market this day, right? And if this broke here, like there's no reason, like it had so much relative strength on this day. I don't know if we could go on a smaller frame, but you guys will see. Um, uh, like on a smaller frame, the market was so bad that day. So like you're tracking these and you're looking at HVs. Like look, look at the relative strength. Like I don't, I wish I could plot the cues as well, but it, this whole day it had every reason to go back right back in. Mm -hmm. It had every reason to do that, but it didn't do it. So that's kind of what drove a lot of my conviction was. We're seeing the highest volume in a year and we're seeing relative strength all in the same day and nobody's looking at it for some reason. So And stay on this for a second. Oh, never mind. All yeah. good. All good. All good. No need to scroll back. 
I was going to point out there's a range breakout on the lower time frame the next day on day two, and it yeah, also right. lines up with date. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yep. So those are your pivots, and that's where you're managing your loss. Yeah, and and if it, I see, hey, you know, you got lucky, sure. So let's say, uh, let's say if it broke out, if it broke down right here, right, and it broke down, I would still take this. I would still take this 10 out of 10 times because I know it will work. When, and when it does, it will make up for those losses, right? So this mindset of I have to be right, I have to make money on this trade, it won't work in the market. So you have to think of probability series of trades. Mark Douglas says it, nobody listens, and they think, you know, um, from a psychological, but series of trades, series of trades. Will, will you take this setup 10 out of 10 times? Yes. If, if you've studied it, you will. If you haven't, then you'll be a little bit iffy and you don't really know what you're uh, doing at that point. So master this. If you master it, you'll take this trade. doesn't matter how, if it gets super close to your stop, you just get stopped out. Hey, it didn't work. But over a series of trades, it will work past it because you've studied it. So um, let's go maybe one more example, Richard. Uh, this one's a good one recently. Uh, ANF. So there's this, you know, as you get more experience, you your brain is kind of filled with more garbage. Uh, like it's Abercrombie and Fitch. What can they do, right? Um, <laughs> so and 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 the way it works is this thing go, this thing goes from thirty to to fifty three, and nobody expects a. If I followed my edge here, I would be far better off than actually knowing what the company does. That's just one you know situation, uh, but. This thing, how does it start? Visualize it at your edge. What's your entry tactic? HVC, volume support. You corner this name. However, if it's going to do this, you'll find a way. And if you keep that simple, you have your edge, you have your entry tactic, and you define it. This one comes out. And you know, if you just take this area right here, the market was pretty good. The market was good since May, by the way. So the market was good. There's no excuse to look at the market at this point. It's more a technical setup. And you define your entry tactics that we discussed, volume support, uh, HVC, and then this thing goes from 20 to, to 53. Did I catch any of it? No, uh, because again, a lot of garbage fills up in your head where you think you're smart. And uh, what can a clothing company that has done absolutely nothing for a very long time do? Well, I get double in the span of a couple of months. So uh, that's what a ANF did. Again, what I'm trying to emphasize here is you have edge, entry tactic, edge, entry tactic, edge, entry tactic, right? And relative strength could, could be your secondary edge. Uh, the way you enter could be, you know, expectation breaker based, range, ba you know, uh, range based as well. Um, but if you just put that in a loop uh, on any particular, you know, entry tactic that you want to, uh, look at and you want to master that you repeatedly just do it and you'll you'll be the best at it uh, better than anybody else out there so yeah and one thing i want to mention and we'll get into this more as we go through screening and stock selection is you know for me i'm a techno fundamentalist so uh the industry group strength the the earnings the sales growth all that matters to me um so we're primarily focused on the te the technical side here with the entry tactics because you know, even if you love the story of a stock and you love the earnings growth, the sales growth, none of that matters unless the price action confirms it. So that's what we're focused on today. But in terms of stock selection and what is it, does a stock have high potential, whatever that means, um, we're still we're still considering everything there. Um, and if you want to bring up CIX, uh, maybe oh, after yeah. this one, I, I want to talk through that. Um, go to a daily. So this was one of the examples I had. Um, I'll draw the base pivot. If you want, can you clear that uh, drawing there? Yeah. Yeah. So again, uh, when it comes to confluence of levels, this is the base pivot. It moved out of a huge base. You had great move on earnings. Was there a surprise on this earning, Rai? Can you can you hover over that and see if? 12% uh, and 12%. Yeah, so nothing crazy, but obviously the price move is what matters. And the, the area- it's, a, it's an energy company, so you won't see a huge surprise. Yeah. 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 But uh, the the pivot or whatever example I had, it was this range right here, this tightness here. And maybe bring up RMV real quick as well. 
just to yeah. emphasize that. Um, right. So yeah, you can see we're we're testing out uh, technical patterns, dots to highlight tight areas. Uh, we'll so I had a point uh, twenty. Uh, look back and then I said RMV less than eight. So. Yeah, yeah. So we're testing this out and this will be added and we'll also of course be adding RMV as a data point to screen by, which would be awesome. But yeah, the 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 range I used as an example was right here where it's compressing against that base pivot. Uh and again that confluence where the entry tactic is lining up with the overall setup, it's so so important. This is just broken out of a monster base and was giving there was no give back, right? um so that's really key so that that's why i really want to emphasize and also it. rotation yeah. into the group and and yeah. a lot of this price action when when billy O'Neill pulled you know said a number 37 percent, he just didn't pull it out of nowhere you know thin thin air so a lot of this run is related to the fact that energy Coal, energy and market are moving up yeah. uh, and there was rotation into that group that drove this price action earnings can be used as catalysts or it is an excuse. In energy space, they're used as an excuse to accumulate more stock, even though from a fundamental perspective, this is not some groundbreaking thing that just happened here. It's just the fact that people see rotation into this group, they pile in, uh, and you're going off the back of 37% of a stock's move. Probably you know, a little more in the energy space is dependent on uh, the industry group itself. So that's a, that's a variant of this. Yeah, uh, I see something here. Uh, we're working on this indicator. It'll be released. Ry gets special privileges. Oh, it's, and he, uh, oh, it's, it's released. There. Okay, cool, cool. It's right here. Technical you patterns. You just type DV and you, you access it. There you go. Oops. Perfect. Yeah, but yeah, there's a lot of these where the patterns. Yep. So we spoke about oops reversals. You could plot those. Yeah. Um, Kicker, another entry tactic that's pretty powerful. So. Yeah, test those out. Uh, highly recommend DFU, but we'll mention at the end. But let's go through one more example, right? I think. Yeah. We've been going for two and a half hours now, which is awesome. Thank you guys all for sticking with us. Hopefully, you guys are getting a lot out of it. I I like this one. Let's. I, I don't know if you want me to cover this, but yeah, let's do it. Apps Apps probably one of the strongest names, and Nick Nick's been killing this one. So. Yeah. So, um, let's uh, let's start at the bottom left, right? Uh, same thing. Poor closing range. Highest volume in a year, probably set it here, have it on your watch list. And this is consolidating. Maybe you see an entry over here at this point, right? Could be depending on the situation you're in, the names you have in your portfolio, all of that stuff. I think it became really obvious to everybody over here where it capped up highest volume since, you know, in over a year. Yeah, that's your edge. Closing range is okay. It's about fifth, you know, not too high, not too low. It's kind of like a doji, whatever you want to call it at that uh, point in time. Now you have, you search for volume support or you search for HVC, or you could take the high of this day. Those three could be your, your particular, you know, short-term entry areas. This thing, you know, gaps up, didn't really do anything. Even if let's say you're, you're long here, right? Let's draw a loss. Let's talk about losses. So that's important. It's not some magic wand that you have. So if you entered on the high of this and it came back in, you exit this name. If you didn't move your stops up as it moved up and it comes back in, you 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 say, hey, I was wrong. Good. The market just, just stopped me out. Too bad. That's it. You take a loss and you keep watching it, right? So this stock continues to hold the low of this area, continues to, to, to form a range. What I liked about this stock was the fact that the whole number 20 held as the stock came back in. And the fact that we see pullback on high volume, pullback on high volume, right? Increasing volume, increasing pullback. What's my expectation on this day? What's the expectation on that day? The expectation is this stock is going to continue lower, right? This stock is going to continue to break the low of this day and it doesn't. So that's what we spoke about with expectation breakers, using expectation breakers as potential entry areas on names. The stock on this day completely breaks the expectation of what should happen when we have a price and volume relationship of a pullback on high volume should continue to see sideways or lower action. It didn't do that on this day. So the stock then tightens, right? This is kind of a range breakout. This is a range breakout. 
This is a range breakout. This is a consolidation. So these are consolidations, mini consolidations within that. All of it starts from here. All of this starts from here. Even if you lost money on this name, we spoke about the fact that if the primary trend of a name is to the upside, you must continue to track it. It takes a lot of time for traders to learn this concept. It takes a lot of time. I used to take this off my radar right here. I would never look at this company and this thing still moved from 2040, right? So uh, if it completely breaks down and it's trading somewhere over here, then it makes sense for me to get rid of it from a high, high volume. But it's still within that range. Give it some benefit of doubt, continue to track it, deploy different entry tactics that you have because the potential of a stock when it gaps up, especially in May, this was early in the market cycle. We'll get into that concept as well. The potential for these doublers or whatever you want to call these, like things that move and double, PLTR, uh, you know, CELH, ANF, all of these all happen around like May timeframe when the market was about to get really, really good, right? So continue to track this. And then, yeah, Richard, I don't, I, I you probably see a lot more entry tactics here because there's so much tightening. There's so many tight areas. Yeah. yeah. Bring up RMV on this one just to, just to show that. But yeah, look, look at all like these. This is, yeah. this is tight. This is tight. This is tight. This is tight. Like it, it trades so well. This one, uh, the ADR on this name is like less than 5%, but it trades so well. It gives you the opportunity to really accumulate stock and keep going. Now we see this earnings gap up again, right? So if you didn't catch it over here, that's fine. We see another earnings gap. We see not the best closing range, right? But it continues to hold. We draw HVC. That's our first way. We draw volume. Uh, could be a whole number, 35 area for sure. And volume support. Corner this name in as the... We see a big gap up on big volume, volume higher than this earnings. That's our edge. Now deploy entry tactics on top of that. Edge. Yeah. So. An another edge with this name is a, the software theme has been so strong, right? That's yeah. been one of the leadership groups. So we're always thinking about, you know, the rotation, where things are going. Ross is super big on that. And uh, the software theme has been one of the strongest of kind of the growth stock themes out there. Uh, and I don't know, I don't know about the earnings and sales on this one, but uh, for me, price okay. action, yeah, price action always overlay. Yeah, so, you know, huge earnings growth um, and great estimates as well. I love in DV, you can see the, the estimates super clearly. Um, and we can see that color bar highlights acceleration in the revenue. If you, if you scroll to the right on the stats table, you can see that color bar under underneath here. I'll actually point it out. That shows that there's acceleration expected in those estimates. So, yeah. Yeah. This, this one trades uh, more on sales. So we see 738, 767, 787. That's three consecutive quarters of increasing sales. And then the same thing. So expected growth from a revenue perspective on this name is high. Now you combine that with this HV edge, plus now we see relative strength. The market is below the 50-day. The QQQ is below the, you know, right at its 50-day. APP is above it's 21 day. So relative strength also exists. Now you're compounding your number, you know, now you're accumulating the number of edges that you see on a name. And this has built a consolidation pivot. We have a, I should probably start. Should go like that just to zoom in. So let's just take a look at this and act like nothing else exists. So if we take a look at that, we see this is our new consolidation pivot. Wow, it grew that horribly. This line is our new consolidation pivot, right? Pull back into the 21 day. This is the first time the stock has pulled back into the 21. First time since this earning gap. So this is your 21 day. Never tested, never tested, never tested, never tested, tested, pull back. Now it's trying to hold the 21 day. So one entry tactic could be the first pullback to 21. I love playing those, uh, but it also depends on the market, right? So I didn't get into this, but now you have a consolidation pivot defined. And if this were to go up and through as the market finds its footing, then you can enter this name to see if it continues higher, right? So I think we can, we can end it there or- Yeah, let's bring back the presentation uh, here. 
So we've gone through some live examples. Hopefully that helps bring everything together. Uh, and uh, yeah, here's a quick kind of key questions to think about um, as you're preparing to make an entry. Um, this kind of brings together everything we talked about. Is the market and general context right for new buys? How aggressive should you be? Is the stock uh, exhibiting my edges? Which ones you can list them out? Is the stock completing a larger pattern? So I set up again, we've stressed how important that is to not treat the entry tactics in isolation. Can I currently use one of my entry tactics to enter? If not, there's no reason to enter. Uh, can I manage my risk tightly and logically? If not, it's not a proper entry tactic or an entry point. If I could only take one trade a month, would I take this one? That's important. Uh, could the stock realistically double from this point? Ryan mentioned that, you know, looking for those edges. Uh, if it were the weekend, I was looking back on my actions. What I say buying here is a high probability play. So try to do hindsight backwards, if that makes sense, if that's possible. Uh, try to, you know, take take a step out of the moment for a second and try to look at as objectively as you can uh, at to, the price action. I, I used to at some point record myself, yeah. record my trade execution and just voice what I'm thinking, just to look back and <laughs> just be like, what the hell was I yeah. thinking? Yeah. But uh, that's that's a good, like, really aggressive way for you to control or have some framework to your thought process. It's super hard because real time is so, there's so many things happening and, and your mind just gets different thoughts, but that's one way. You could just record your execution, right? Uh, it could be an audio, it could be a note, it could be whatever. But then you look back at it and say, you know, uh, I, what was I doing? Why, why was I saying saying that stuff? But yeah, yep. yep. That's one. Way to and last one. This is kind of to ask yourself uh, where to place your stop loss. What price action would tell you that your entry tactic has failed? Where where are you wrong? Where will I cut cut your loss again? Cutting your loss is the most important thing. That's what's going to ensure you don't blow up your account and stay in the game. So that's pretty much it. I think we can go to the next slide here. Um, yeah, if you so have, download the yeah. ultimate trading guide if you haven't. Uh, it's available. Link in chat. I don't know, Richard, if you'll paste it. Yeah, uh, give me one second. Spread word, post it, share it. You know, it's absolutely free. Uh, this whole webinar is also free um, as well. So uh, it's all, you know, if you're on the list, you'll receive the recording. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you'll receive the recording. You can watch this as many times over. Uh, leave comments on the video if you're watching video. From this, you know, if you're watching the recording, leave comments, questions in the uh, underneath. We we're happy to answer those um, as well. So the more people we get, we had more than our first two webinars um, here today. So the, you guys are doing a good job of spreading word and making sure that a lot of people can benefit from it. So yeah, and in uh, the chat right now, I'm pasting a link to to help us spread word. Well, actually, first, yeah, if you want to try out DeepView, highly recommend it. Um, I'll post a link to DeepView uh, in the chat right here. Um, in my opinion, the absolute best tool for growth style trading. Um, and we're coming out with new features, you know, every week almost. So uh, you, you've seen a lot of examples. You've seen us use it in these webinars, uh, sh shown what it can do with the indicators we're developing that complement uh, everything we're talking about. So um, definitely check it out. And uh, I see some questions about uh, India. That's in our plans, Q, Q4 this year, Q1 next year. Uh, definitely check it out. Uh, Steve says, DFU is insane, so good. Yep, that's awesome feedback. Um, but yeah, definitely check that out. And yeah, one- India 2024. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's yeah. definitely happening. Uh, yeah. I will, if you have any suggestions on pricing and stuff, we're trying to figure that out. Make it most fair and competitive in, in that you know part of the world. So uh, the next is, yeah, questions. Uh, I think we've answered most of them, so we'll end it here. Uh, yeah. Any questions when you watch the recording, put it in the description as well. Um, and anything that we could do better, let us know and tag us on Twitter, right? Uh, or X, so, uh, so that we could improve upon it. Again, this was more about diving into entry tactics. And the most important part is find an edge, Step one, step two, corner that name through entry tactics and find a way to enter that winner, but with tight and logical stops and tight and logical risk areas so that you can skew the risk reward in your favor 
and execute those two things, edge, entry tactic, edge, entry. It doesn't matter if you didn't take away anything else, just take those two steps away. And you will see, you could do that with VVOPs, pivots, Fibonacci's, RSI, MACD, you know, clouds, et cetera. It doesn't matter. It will always work. Those two frameworks will work uh, yeah. for you. One hundred percent. And thank you guys all for sticking with us. There, there's still hundreds of you guys left here, which is amazing. Um, if you did find value in this, uh, we do have one small ask. Uh, help us spread the word, as Rye mentioned. And I'll be posting in the chat right now a tweet intent, which if you give that a click and then tweet it out, helps uh, share you know with with everybody the registration link for the next webinar. I saw some people asking for that for for that as well. So please go ahead and share that if, you, if you're able to, uh, we'd really appreciate it. Um, and we really hope sincerely that this has helped you uh, today uh, cement some learning. Um, once again, you have to go out and apply it for yourself, gain that experience. But if we can shorten your learning curve and help you along your journey, uh, that's super valuable in itself for us. And um, yeah, I just wanna thank you guys one more time for uh, spending a few hours of your Saturday with us, your valuable weekend. So. Uh, thank you so much, Rye. Anything you want to close things off with? No, uh, suggestions, etc. cetera. Will, will you always take a look? So send those and uh, the next webinar will be uh, even better than this one. Yeah, I saw, I saw one from John uh, that was uh, maybe something focused only on uh, traders who work full time. That could be an idea for a future webinar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's a huge uh, amount of people. So yeah, perfect. So once again, thank you guys all for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, the recording, leave a like down below, subscribe to the channel. And uh, we're really looking forward to the next few ones and hope you guys uh, tune in uh, to those as well. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of your Saturday. Cheers. Yeah, have a good one.